Otherwise, yeah, I request everybody to mute, please. Yeah, so very warm good morning, good evening to all of you from whichever place you are in the world. And on behalf of the Department of Mathematics, Punjab University, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this memorial webinar in honor of Professor IBS Parsi. Died at the age of 82, Professor Parsi has been active with mathematics. I think it's uh, Professor Pasi and his for me there's an echo importance. Although he's not with us today, his work will live on for generations, and India is proud of the mathematics legacy left behind by him. So may I request our chairperson, Professor Dinesh Khurana, to say a few words before we start the lecture. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Bhakti. So we have gathered here today on a very somber occasion to pay our tributes to Professor I.B.S. Parsi, who has left us for heavenly abode on October 2nd, 2021. Professor Parsi has had an amazing academic career, as we all know. He was continuously teaching from 1961 to 2021. That is for about 60 years at various institutions in India and abroad. For instance, he taught at Kurukshetra University for 18 years, Punjab University for about 21 years, regularly from 1979 to 2000, HRI Alabad for five years from 2000 to 2005, Iser Mohali for about 14 years from 2007 to 2021, Ashoka University for about five years. Besides this, Professor Parsi had an enviable research career of about 52 years. On MathSciNet, Professor Parsi's first research paper appeared in 1968 and the last one in 2020. There may be a few in print also. A teaching career of 60 years together with an active research career of 58 years makes Professor's, Professor Parsi's achievements very, very rare. During his academic career, he published about 100 research papers and 10 books. MathSciNet has a list of his 37 research collaborators all over the world. Besides collaborating and mentoring several mathematicians from India, Professor Parsi also collaborated with mathematicians from USA, Russia, Germany, France, Canada, Japan, Switzerland, Singapore, Greece, and Brazil. Professor Parsi supervised 10 PhD students. To honor his academic contribution, Professor Parsi was awarded several awards, several national and international awards. To name a few, he was fellow of all the three science academies in India. He was awarded highest scientific award, the Shanti Saru Patnagar Award. He was awarded Meghnan Saha Award, just to leave a few just to list a few. Besides this, he was also on the editorial board of various reputed journals. For instance, Journal of Indian Mathematical Society, Indian Journal of Pure and Applied Mathematics, Journal of Group Theory, etc. We, th we thank all the three speakers, Professor Hales, Prasad, and Margolis for agreeing to talk on such a short notice. We will look forward to know many more things about Professor Parsi and his research work during today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Gurmichi. Thank you, Dinesh Ji. So let's start with our first lecture uh, by Professor Alfred W. Hales, Emeritus Professor at University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, professor Hales has been a collaborator, a friend, and more than that, what I would hear from Professor Parsi, he was like a brother for him. And so let's now listen the same story from Professor Hales about group rings, their memories, their collaboration. So I invite Professor Hales for his talk on in the Beer Singh Pasi group rings and memories. Professor Hales, please. Thank you, Gurmeet. On October 2nd, I lost a close friend and a superb collaborator. And the mathematical world lost a great man. 
Indra Beer and I wrote 11 papers together over a 40 year time period. And today I would like to survey at least portions of most of these papers, but mix this in with a number of memories, interactions between Indra Beer and his family, myself and my family. Inderbeer and I grew up halfway around the world from each other, but our mathematical lineages ended up overlapping rather quickly. Uh, okay. Inderbeer received his PhD in 1966 from the University of Exeter. His advisor was David Rees, and Rees's advisor at Cambridge University was Philip Hall. I received my PhD in 1962 from Caltech in Pasadena, California, and then went off to England to Cambridge on the postdoctoral position. And my postdoctoral advisor was Philip Hall. So Inderbeer's mathematical grandfather was my postdoctoral advisor. We did not meet right away. In fact, we didn't meet for another 10 or 15 years in 1977 to 78, I spent a sabbatical leave from UCLA at the University of Warwick in Coventry, England, at the Mathematics Institute there. They were sponsoring a symposium on infinite groups and group rings during the first six months of 1978. And very fortunately for me, and I hope for him, uh, he visited there for six months. For me, that was a very providential meeting. It had an enormous effect on my future career. Now, what I want to do is to talk a little bit about the mathematics we did during the six months. Uh, but first, I'm going to show you a picture of at least some of the participants in that symposium. So here's a picture. This is actually only half of the participants. Uh, it's the left half of them, so to speak. Uh, but if you look at the top row on the far left, the second person is a tall enderbeer with a dark mustache. And if you look at the second from the bottom row, the third person in is myself with glasses on. And next to me is a tiny little girl who's our youngest daughter, Kathy. Um, if you stare at this picture long enough, you may find other people that you know, although of course we all look different many years later. Um, so during that six months that we overlapped at the University of Warwick, um, we already wrote two papers together. It turns out all of our papers together were about group rings. So I need to start by setting up terminology and reminding you of some things about group rings. Uh, to start with, G is going to be an arbitrary group, possibly infinite, and ZG is going to be its integral group ring, a collection of all finite linear combinations of group elements with integer coefficients. And I'll denote by delta the augmentation ideal of ZG, with the ideal generated by all elements G minus one as G runs through capital G. So if you think about this ideal for a minute, it's pretty obvious that the group ring modulo of this ideal is just isomorphic to Z itself, to the integers. Also, if you look at delta modulo the square of delta, it's not difficult to see that that is actually perfect to G abelianized. In other words, G modulo its commutator subgroup. Uh, you have to think about it a second. The arithmetic in delta mod delta squared is additive. The arithmetic in G mod G prime is multiplicative. But those are isomorphic as abelian groups. Now, the things of most interest to me and to interview, I think, certainly at this time, were the following three things. One is further augmentation quotients. In other words, delta to the nth power modulo delta the n plus first power for n bigger than or equal to two. These are called the augmentation quotients. What you're basically doing here is slicing the group ring up into a many slices and studying them slice by slice. Another thing of great interest is the units or invertible elements in ZG. And finally, we're interested in Jordan decomposition in ZG and I'll have to explain this in more detail later on. So the first paper we wrote together is about augmentation quotients. It's the next stage after delta mod delta squared. It's looking at delta squared mod delta cubed. Now, good 
description of this starts by letting G sub n denote the nth term of the lower central series for G. So we have a coincidence of terminology. G sub 2 is the same as G prime, the augmentation. Uh, uh, sorry, the uh, commutator subgroup. Um, also, so G mod G2 is abelian, and we'll let SP2 of G mod G2 denote the symmetric product of G mod G2 with itself. And then there's a natural short exact sequence, which I have displayed here. Zero maps to G2 mod G3, maps into delta squared mod delta cubed, maps on to SP2, the symmetric product, and then maps to zero. And you would have a complete description of delta squared mod delta cubed if you knew this sequence split. So that was a question that Inderbeer had. And fortunately, he asked me about this question, and we started collaborating on this. And we ended up writing a paper which appeared in 1978 in Arch Archive of Mathematics. And we proved two things, or rather a collection of things. First of all, several positive results that the sequence splits if G mod G2 is torsion. Remember, it's, it's certainly abelian. If it's torsion, or it's a direct sum of cyclic groups, or it's completely decomposable torsion free. But we came up with an example when G mod G2 is torsion free of rank two, where the sequence does not split. So it does not always split, but it splits in many cases. Now, we were happy with this result and we were particularly happy with the timing. The timing was impeccable because Inderbir Passi had, was just finishing a monograph on group rings and augmentation ideals. In fact, it was the definitive monograph on this. And we finished this paper just in time. It appeared on the last page of his monograph. Uh, so I said that was impeccable timing. We were quite happy with that. Oh, I should point out here, this, this result also disproved a conjecture of Alton Waters about cyclic groups. I won't go into details about that. So that was our first paper together. And then another paper that we started during that those six months at Warwick, but we didn't finish till a year or two later, was something connected with the dimension subgroup problem. So for each n, let d sub n denote the set of little g and big g so that g minus 1 lies in the nth power of the augmentation ideal. This is called the nth dimension subgroup. And clearly, this, uh, the nth term of the lower central series, g sub n, is a subgroup of d sub n. This is easy to prove. And the dimension subgroup problem asks when these two things are equal. In other words, for which capital G and for which little n is it true that G sub n and D sub n co coincide? And I didn't say this here, but when they don't coincide, you're interested in the quotient D sub n modulo G sub n. So our second paper, which was joint with Narayan Gupta, didn't actually appear until uh, 1984 in Krell's journal. First of all, if G is finitely generated metabelian, we prove that there's some n naught depending only on G mod G prime, so that these two things, Gn and Dn, agree for all n past n naught. In other words, eventually they can coincide. And we also proved that when G mod G prime is, at, is elementary abelian, a more severe restriction, that you can take n naught equals one, namely all Gn equals Dn for all n. Um, this is a famous, the overall problem is a famous problem. There have been many, many results by many other people since then. Um, I should mention here that I met Gupta in 1978 at work. That's when we started working on this. He was an old friend of Passy's, and he ended up spending most of his life teaching at the University of Winnipeg in Canada. And incidentally, he's the only co-author we had that we both knew. There were a number of other co-authors, but he's the only one that we both knew. All right. Um, so after, at the end of uh, at the summer of 1978, I went back to California to UCLA, and Inder Beer went back to India. And we kept corresponding with each other, but not seriously. We had no specific research program. And roughly 10 years went by. And then two extraordinary and lucky things happened. Inder Beer applied for an Indo-American travel grant to enable him to visit the USA and carry out research with several mathematicians he knew, including me. So he visited UCLA for three months in late 1987. And during that academic year, 87, 88, the UCLA's math department chair quit two years early. And I found myself unexpectedly being appointed chair for the next three years. Uh, 
I have very mixed feelings about that. Um, but it gave me the ability to arrange for a visiting professorship for Enderbeer for 15 months from the fall of 1988 through the December of 1989. So I said that he was just with me for three months in late 1987. But I was able to arrange for a 15 month period a year or so later. I was particularly happy about this because it's very easy for a chair to get caught up in administrative matters and let their research suffer. But Interbur's presence at UCLA helped me to avoid this. He was all, always there waiting to work with me and I could show the administrative matters aside if I, if I had the uh, willpower to do this. Um, so I should say at this point, we started to work on the program that was gonna occupy us for the next 20 or so years. Uh, and that is studying Jordan decomposition. Uh, I'll remind you of details about this, but after we've been working on this program for a number of years, Inderbeer came up with a catchy title for this. He said we were traversing the Jordan Trail. So that's the title of this slide. This is the beginning of the Jordan Trail, which was the journey to occupy us for a long time. So to remind you of what I'm going to be talking about, here's something you learned in in your first linear algebra course. It's about Jordan canonical form. If you have a square matrix over the complex numbers, you can always conjugate it to something that looks roughly like the one on the left here. Namely, you have non-zero elements possibly down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else except the occasional ones just above the diagonal. This is Jordan canonical, called Jordan canonical form. And when you have a matrix in that form, there's an obvious way to write it as the sum of two much simpler things. You can write it as the sum of what you get with just the diagonal elements. That's a semi-simple matrix, meaning it's minimal polynomial, has no repeated roots. And the other piece is just the ones that were in it. That's obviously nilpotent. And it's not quite so obvious, but those two things actually commute. The first times the second is the same as the second times the first. So this, and once you see this, you see that in fact you could carry out a similar decomposition for any square matrix over the complex numbers, because you can conjugate anything to Jordan canonical form, then you can do this and then you can conjugate back. All right, but we're not gonna be talking directly about matrices. We're gonna generalize this to group rings. So let G be a finite group and let F be a field of characteristic zero, such as mainly we'll be talking about Q being the rationals, or F being the rationals Q. And it turns out, mimicking what was on the previous slide, if you have an X in the group ring FG, so we're looking at coefficients from F now, uh, the field, then you can always write X as a sum, little s plus little n, where S is semi-simple, meaning it's minimal polynomial, has no repeated roots, N is nilpotent, and S times N is equal to N times S. And this representation, representation is unique, and it's called the additive Jordan decomposition. Uh, and this is really easy to prove, essentially the same proof as the one that works for matrices that I had on the previous slide. But we're going to ask a more serious or difficult question. Suppose your initial X didn't just lie in ZG, but it had integer coefficients, not just rationals. Then you know that two parts, S and N, have to lie in QG from what I just said in the previous paragraph. But the question is, when can be sure, we be sure that they also have integer coefficients? So our definition now is that ZG has AJD, which stands for additive Jordan decomposition. If for any X in the integer group ring, little s and little n, its components must also lie in the integer, integer group rings. In other words, its coefficients, coefficients are not just rationals, but are integers. That's going to be the focus, at least for a while, of our main interest. So let me move on now to our first result along these lines. Um, but I'm going to take a slight digression here. I'm talking mainly about z the integers, but you could do this for any ring. Replace z by, well, almost any, with an integral net domain and replace f by its quotient field. Uh, and when we started to look at this question for the integers, we wondered if the ar arithmetic of z uh, played a major role or not. And so we had the idea of tr also trying to look at this when we replace z by the ring of all algebraic integers which I'll call script O. In that case, Q gets replaced by the algebraic closure of Q. So, well, but first let me make one comment here. Um, 
the AJD I just talked about holds trivially if G is abelian, because it's well known that the group ring has no nilpotence when G is abelian. And if there are no, no nilpotence except zero, then N is zero, and then S has to be X, and so everything has integer coefficients. Well, going to the next slide, the first result on this slide is that if G is a finite group, now from now on, G is always going to be finite and O is the ring of all algebraic integers, not just Z, then the question we're interested in essentially evaporates. The group ring OG has added a Jordan decomposition if and only if G is abelian. So that's not very interesting. We're going to forget that from now on. Uh, let's go back to the Z coefficients. What we managed to prove is that if you have a dihedral group of order 2P where P is an odd prime, then the integral group ring even though it does have no potents in it, it does have additive Jordan decomposition. So this is an infinite, infinite collection of groups, none of which are abelian, and they all, they're an integral group ring and for every one of them has AJD. So that was our first positive result. And there were other results in the paper too, but I'm, I'm concentrating, concentrating on this one. And there are two comments here. One is that already we noticed that the representation theory of G plays a major role in, in investigating this. And the other thing I should point out here is that Luther, our co-author on this paper, was a colleague of Passy, and in fact was a former teacher of Passy. Uh, I never met him, unfortunately. Um, I do have copies of the book that Luther and Passy worked together, the four volume book, uh, of course in algebra, but I never met Luther. All right, so that was the first paper that we proved during those 15 months. First paper we wrote during those 15 months. The second paper was a more definitive one. And this is, appeared in 1991 in Archived or Mathematics, just by the two of us. It's a complete solution in a sense to the additive Jordan decomposition question. If G is a finite group so that the integral group ring has additive Jordan decomposition, then one of three things has to happen. Either it's abelian, and I already made the comment, that then things are trivial, because there are no nil potents. And it turns out there's another case that was well known where there are no nil potents. And that's kind of strange, but here's a description. If G is isomorphic to the product of the quaternion group of order A and an elementary abelian two group E and an abelian group A of odd order with the extra condition that the multiplicative order of two modulo the size of A is odd, then it turns out there are no nil potents in ZD there either. So clearly additive Jordan decomposition will hold. And then the third possibility is that G is one of the ones I mentioned on the previous slide, the dihedral group of order 2P for P is an odd prime. So we proved not only that this is when AGT holds, but those are the only cases where additive Jordan decomposition holds. So here are three infinite classes of cases where AJD holds for ZG, and there are no other groups of this sort. Um, it was a nice result, but in a sense, after we've done it anyway, it, it appeared too easy or relatively easy, and we turned our attention to a much harder problem. Uh, that's multiplicative Jordan decomposition. And I can explain, explain that in two different ways. The easy way to explain it is, we'll say that G has multiplicative or Jordan decomposition if just the units in it, the invertible elements in ZG, have the property that N, S and N lie in ZG. So we're, we're not asking as much. We're not asking that every element in ZG decompose nicely, just that the ones that are units. Of course, there may not be very many units, and that doesn't produce much of a condition then. So you would expect there would be more examples here. Uh, might make life easier. It might make life harder. Uh, it turns out it makes life much harder. And the let me say here, why do we call this multiplicative? Well, if X is equal to S plus N, you can write, at the as you see at the bottom of this slide, X is equal to S times 1 plus S inverse N, which makes sense as long as you know S is invertible, and it turns out it will be if X is invertible. So now we have X written as the product of some, something that's semi-simple and something that's unipotent, namely 1 plus nilpotent. So that's where the term multiplicative Jordan decomposition comes from. Well, this actually occupied us for the next 20 years. Um, but before I continue with the 
more description of this Jordan Trail, I want to talk about what else happened during those 15 months. Uh, it was a very hectic time for a lot of reasons, but we had many opportunities to interact with Interbeer and his family. And I want to talk about some of these as part of the personal memories. It turns out they all involve, uh, how should I put it, special occasions, holidays and things like that. Uh, so let me start. By so this is what happened from in 1989 during the time Interbeer was at UCLA as a visiting professor. First thing is that in late November of 1988, Interbeer flew back to India for a few days for his older daughter Monica's wedding there. And it turned out that her new father-in-law had received his MS degree from Caltech on the very same day that I got my PhD at Caltech there. Uh, of course, I didn't know him. In fact, he probably, his family never knew the passage at that point. I don't really know. But that was an amazing coincidence. And I actually, I put an asterisk on my first slide about this, but I forgot to mention it. So that was very interesting. But Interbeer was only able to stay there for a couple of days because he had to come back to UCLA to, com to continue his teaching. But all of a sudden, there was a link between Monica's family and, and me with, because of Caltech. Now, in early 1989, Interbeer's wife, Surrender, came and joined him in Los Angeles. And shortly after that, their younger daughter, Erica, came and joined him, joined him too. Uh, so we had most of the family three of the four, everyone except Monica, in Los Angeles. And on a very nice and supposedly random day in the summer of 1989, it was really good weather, and we called up Surrender Interbeer and Erica and asked them to join us on a sightseeing drive and a visit to Malibu Beach. So they joined us, and we drove through the hills to get to Malibu Beach. Interestingly enough, we stopped at a Hindu temple in the hills above Malibu. Uh, we heard about this. We didn't know anything about it. We thought to stop there. And while we were there looking at things, Surrender turned to us and said, did you know that today is Interbeer's birthday? And in fact, it's his 50th birthday. We were absolutely flabbergasted. We have no idea about this at all. We were extremely lucky to have picked that day for the weekend jaunt. So we went on to Malibu, had a nice lunch there, turned around and drove home, bought a cake and celebrated his birthday back at our house. The third thing, thing I want to, so I've covered a wedding and a birthday now. Now I want to talk about Thanksgiving Day, which is a big holiday in the States. Uh, every year at Thanksgiving, my mother would put on a dinner for, for all of the family at the Valley Hunt Club in Pasadena. And she was thrilled that Ninderbeer and Surrender were there and could join us. So the whole family had dinner together. And my mother felt it was her social coup of the year, especially with Surrender wearing her lovely sari. So now let me show you some pictures of all these events. Here we are. Top picture is of the three of us, of the four of us, excuse me, at the Hindu temple in the hills above Malibu. I should say all these pictures were taken by Erica. So unfortunately, Erica doesn't appear in them. The second picture is at the beach in Malibu. Again, the four of us having lunch. And the third picture is back at our house in Pacific Palisades and we're now sharing a birthday cake in honor of Interbeer. So that covers the birthday. And now on to Thanksgiving. Here's a picture of the four of us in my mother's house in Pasadena. And they're surrendered with their sari. We're all dressed up. And this now is at the Valley Hunt Club where we're having the dinner. And there's a picture of Surrender, and then my wife, Virginia, and Interbeer, and then this is my mother, Gwendolyn Hales, who I believe was 87 at the time. So that finishes the social event, so to speak, from that 15-month period. Now, unfortunately, we never had a long period like 15 months after that to be with Interbeer. There were just, in the future, a succession of short visits. So most of the work we had on pursuing the Jordan Trail had to be done by email with a very occasional phone call and also a very occasional short visit. Um, so now let me talk a little bit about the next stages in the Jordan Trail. I'll remind you of the definition of multipli multiplicative Jordan decomposition. Here is just a repeat of what I had before. You want to be able to do the composition I mentioned before every time X happens to be a unit. So our first paper having to do with this 
was joint with Satya Aurora, who was a student of Passy's. And I never met her, as a matter of fact. So it's another co-author we never met. So when we started looking at MJD, we were trying in part to look at a bunch of small groups to accumulate evidence, but also to get some idea of what the overall pattern was and what general arguments might work. So we started looking at groups of order eight and groups of order 12. And we proved that MJD held for ZD8, the dihedral, dihedral group of order eight, and similarly for ZQ12, the generalized quaternion group of order 12. That's where you have a cyclic subgroup of order three, which is normal, and an element of order four, and the element of order four conjugates everything of order three to its inverse. So MJT ho holds for those two cases, but it fails for the dihedral group of order 12, that's the symmetries of the hexagon, and it also fails for the alternating group of A4, which has 24, sorry, which has 12 elements. Um, so this was evidence, and it gave us some feeling for what was going on. But then that was in 93, Communications and Algebra. In 1998, another paper by the three of us, Satya Aurora again, proved several things. The first was the first really interesting so the general argument, namely if multiplicative Jordan decomposition holds for ZG, then every matrix in the Wedderburn decomposition of ZG must have dimension at most three. So I'll remind you, the Wedderburn decomposition of QG writes QG is a direct sum of matrix rings over division rings. And so the condition here is that each one of these uh, matrix rings has its dimension at either one, two, or three. And if MJD holds, then this must hold for the Wedderburn decomposition. And so results about representation theory can narrow things down a lot here. In this paper, we proved MJD held for another group, but in fact, not just for a single group, for an infinite class of groups that included Q12 on the, from the previous slide. It holds for Z, Q4, Q sub 4P, where Q sub 4P is the generalized quaternion group of order 4P, and P is any odd prime. So that's the first example of something that holds, where MGD holds and AJD does not, where you have an infinite class. Another thing we proved is that MGD held for a particular group of order 16. I think at that stage, I can't remember the details now, we knew it, about it for another group of order 16 also, where the uh, AJD did not hold. But uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And this paper had a bunch of other things in it too, including something that was too long to put on this slide. We have a, had a list of about 10 or 12 different dihedral light groups where MJD failed. So this was more accumulation of evidence. Uh, and I should also say here that after this paper that I mentioned in 98, and before our next paper, Michael Parmenter from Canada actually looked into all the groups of order 16, and he determined exactly which ones had MJD JD for ZG and which ones didn't. So that was a contribution to this program. Now let me go on to our next and what I consider our definite our best paper by far. So this is a joint paper in the Journal of Algebra in 2007, Hales, Passy, and Wilson. Now, Larry Wilson is a young colleague of mine here in California, and interviewer never met him. So that's the other collaborator that, that we did, never we didn't both meet. So the paper has a lot of material in it, but I'm going to list the most important lemma and the most important theorems. So the lemma is the following. If G is finite and ZG has MJD, and if you have a nilpotent element in ZG, then epsilon times Z will also be in ZG for all the central idempotents, epsilon of QG, the group over the, over the rationals, grouping over the rationals. Now there's another way to look at this, which I like better. Namely, if Z has MJD and Z is nilpotent, then under the Wedderburn decomposition, every factor is of Z is nilpotent. When you write Z as a direct sum of these components in each of the Wedderburn pieces. Now, what's really nice and powerful about this is that it doesn't mention units anywhere. If you're trying to test multiplicative Jordan decomposition, you're supposed to test this for every unit. And if you have trouble getting your hands on units, it's going to be very hard to prove anything. But you can do this without 
having your hands on any units at all. If you have this property that you find a nilpotent element that has components, whatever in components that don't have integer coefficients, then you've ruled out MJD. This is, it was a very powerful demo for us and also subsequent authors have used it too for important things. So our main theorem now, this is essentially what we were aiming for for 20 years, is that if Z is, G is a finite two group and if ZG has MJD but not AJD, then there are only, well, there are eight possibilities, three classes. It's either dihedral of order eight, or it's one of the four groups of order 16 that Michael Parmenter had discussed, or it's one of three groups of order 32. And there are no other group finite two groups where Z has MJD. I, I should mention here that dihedral of order eight and, and the ones of order 16 were known already. The three of order through 32 we found ourselves, uh, but the hard part about this was showing that there were no groups with this property of order 64 or greater. Um, as I said, this was a lot of case by case analysis and, and using the powerful lemma I talked about up here and a number of other things too. Now there's another theorem from this paper, uh, which is very interesting and helped to guide further work. Um, but it's a one way theorem. I have to, you have to be careful looking at it. Uh, what the theorem says that if G is a finite group and ZJ has MJD, then one of four, one of the following four possibilities, it must happen. Now it's not the case that these four categories are disjoint. And it's not the case that everything in one of these categories satisfies MJD. It's just if you're looking for new groups that have MJD, they must be among these things, but you have to attack each of these separately. Well, you don't have to attack number one separately because uh, that's already been settled. And you don't have to attack the two group part of number two either, because we just settled it in the previous theorem. Uh, but at this point, the three group question and the two three group question were open. But those were settled fairly soon after this by Don Passman and a Chinese student of his name, Lu. There were two new three groups with MJD and two new two three groups with MJD that were known already and they proved that these were the only ones. So that settled category two completely. Now categories three and four are much more difficult. Um, I've mentioned the Chinese student of Don Passman, a, a student of named Sun of Lu and a, a collaborator of his name Kuo, I believe, made tremendous advances on part three. This is something that looks like one of the one of the middle category for AJD. G is going to be isomorphic to Q8 cross CP with P and odd prime. But now two is not going to have odd order mod P. It's going to have even order mod P. And the two Chinese mathematicians I mentioned actually proved this, that, that this holds for all cases where the order is more than even, it has to be congruent to two mod four. So they sort of done it, have done half of this. Uh, I think the other half is pretty much open. And then finally, category four, in a sense, generalizes the dihedral case. This covers a lot of different groups if you stare at it and see what it's talking about. Um, so the, the Q sub four P case falls in this category. There are a number of partial results here that we had and Passman Lu had and other people too. But there are a lot of cases here that are still open. And my favorite case here is the group of order 136, which is 8 times 17. And it's supposed to have a cyclic sub, normal cyclic subgroup of order 17 and an element of order 8. And that element of order 8 is supposed to invert under conjugation the elements of order 17. This is an open question and a very hard one. So that, in a sense, ended the mathematical part of the Jordan Trail, uh, at least as far as we were concerned. But there are people doing a lot of work, still doing a lot of work in, based on these other results. But I also wanted to talk about some of the personal memories that happened during this period of time. Now, remember this, we're talking about 1990 to 2010 or something, 20 years worth. Uh, and I said, we never had any long visits during that time. But uh, Inderbeer was able to visit us briefly one more time in 1992, just before we moved to La Jolla. I took early retirement from UCLA at that point and took another position. Uh, 
And he, then Vinderbeer visited us twice more in La Jolla in 1997 and 2003. He brought us a very handsome tapestry in 97. And by 2003, we had framed it and hung it in our living room. And finally, in 2005, I got to go to India. Uh, at that time, Inderbir and Surinder were at the Harris Chandra Institute in Allahabad. So I got to visit him for two weeks there, two, so 10 days worth of mathematics and two or three weekends worth of sightseeing. It was very nice. I finally got to meet his older daughter, Monica, and she had us over for a very nice dinner. Also, I was able to visit in Agra, both the Taj Mahal and the famous fort there. I was very surprised to find out that Nidavir had never been to the Taj Mahal before. Uh, I thought that was almost unbelievable. I was also equally happy to go to the fort because I had read about the fort in Agra in a famous Sherlock Holmes story when I was quite young, and it made a big impression on me. And as I said earlier, it was only a couple of years after 2005 when we finished that 2000 paper I mentioned above. So it's basically the two weeks worth of work with him in Allahabad that enables to get the momentum to finish things off. And I should also mention that, jumping ahead quite a bit now, um, in 2012, we celebrated our 50th anniversary, wedding anniversary. And a year later, Inderbeer and Surrender so celebrated theirs. And we traded pictures, and I'll show you pictures of all of these things in just a second. So here's Inderbeer with the very handsome tapestry that he gave to us, now framed and on the wall of our living room. One can stare at this for hours and see very interesting tidbits and things you haven't noticed before. And here's a picture from Allahabad, or well, from India, I should say. The second picture here is actually is in Allahabad, Allahabad. It's Inderbeer and Surinder in front of their house at the First Chandra Institute. And then the picture above that is Inderbeer at his first visit along with me to the Taj Mahal. And the last picture is one we received from Inderbeer and Surinder uh, on their, from their 50th wedding anniversary. And I, I should say that my visit in 2005, I find it hard to believe but that's the last time I ever saw Inderbeer in person. We had three possible trips after that, one for him to come to the United States and two for me to go to India. But all three of them had to be canceled because of either family illness or in one case it was government rest restrictions on travel. So I never saw him again in person. But we did write two more papers together. One was a correction to a mistake in the 2007 paper and the other was a expository paper uh, covering, it was written for, in honor of Don Patton on his 75th birthday, and it surprised our work and also Don's work with the students. But I never saw Inderbeer again, and this went from the anniversary, that is my memory of him and the and of to, to close, I would just like to say that the opportunity of working with Inderbeer, knowing him and working with him, represent high points in both my personal and and pers and professional life. I will miss him forever. Thank you. So, thank you, Professor Hales, for summing up your years of collaboration so nicely and explaining the complex things in a very very simple way. It, it's hard to believe that Professor Parsi is no more with us, but your your talk has just made everything live. So it doesn't look like these are the things of the past. I mean, it's hard to believe. And um, I have been hearing about uh, prof association of Professor Parsi with Professor Hales for uh, last three decades of my association with him. And uh, he used to fondly talk of Professor Hales and their association. And it's so nice to hear the same from Professor Hales. Uh, thank you, Professor Hales, for a very, very lovely talk. And uh, so uh, are there yeah, invite questions? Uh, yes, Professor Ajit Iqbal Singh had raised the hand, please.
wonderful talk indeed and it brought to memory many good things about professor patsy and about group rings too and he was the purest of the pure you know uh, finding conditions within the setup within groups and rings only i tried to impress upon him that we can uh, combine norm and consider normed uh, completions as group algebras but he stuck to pure algebra purest of the pure and professor hales has expressed it so very beautifully and you know i would like to say that within six uh, uh, connections you can be connected to anybody but i'm lucky to be connected to professor hales in more than one way thank you thank you ma'am thank you so are there are there more questions more uh, comments rather comments yeah professor lakshman thank you professor hales yes yeah thank you anybody would like to say any comment okay so let's thank the speaker for a very very lovely talk very very thank you thank you thank you professor hales very very happy talk okay so memory is the essential part of humanity and let's go down the memory line and recall some of the fond memories uh, which we all have with associated with professor pasi so uh, i am getting a message from professor khanduja that she has some urgent work so she has probably to leave early so i will request professor khanduja to share uh, some memories uh, of professor pasi Uh, professor kanduja please yes am i audible yes yes ma'am uh, uh, dear friends uh, uh, i had the good fortune of knowing professor pasi closely uh, uh, for a very uh, from uh, from as early as 1979 when he left kshetra university and joined punjab university department of mathematics as a professor at that time i was a newly appointed lecturer the junior most faculty member of the department of mathematics punjab university i first met him in my guide's office professor is luther a tall graceful man blessed with a very pleasant disposition uh, he was professor pasi when i saw him first so um, uh, Uh, and then uh, um, my uh, my guide professor is luther advised me uh, i was a junior lecturer at that time he advised me to attend his um, uh, special lectures on advanced algebra which he gave to mphil because i had already completed my phd so so that is how our first uh, bond was set up i i attended his lectures and of course i found them amazing slowly and steadily our bond bond grew uh, um, he became the chairperson of her department in 1984 for, he was chairperson for 3 years then i um, uh, observed him more closely i was really impressed with the, his way of working his dedication to work so uh, i found uh, uh, over the years i found him extraordinary in many ways uh at uh, this time is too short for me and uh, i i found that he was an eminent mathematician a dedicated teacher an able administrator and above all a very compassionate human being he was a man of few words whenever he spoke everybody listened and he was what i find uh, uh, extraordinary about him that after the age of 60 which is the official retirement age in india he wrote more than 60 papers mentored a number of students i also he i also he was associated with setting up of the mathematics department at bali which i also joined 
in 2007 uh, at the, uh, on the advice of Professor Pasi. So we were colleagues in Punjab University. Mm -mm. We were colleagues in Aysar Mohali. In Aysar Mohali, my office was just opposite to his. We, our, our offices faced each other. Every time, mm -mm, uh, uh, he was an avid reader. He had a lot of collection of books and he was browsing not only himself browsing on one new book mm -hmm. or other he had a lot of uh, uh, students whom he mentored at Aysar Mohali uh, unofficially and officially as well so uh, what I found it very extraordinary about him that he he was the one who uh, who could spot a talent in a student or in a junior colleague like me he he proposed me my name to the three major science academies of india and every time it was true so he uh, he encouraged me throughout my life to perform best we went to several conferences together, uh, accompanied by mrs Passi also uh, and I not only uh, not only learned mathematics from him, I learned how uh, how, how to uh, how to deal with mathematicians, how to how to uh, you know welcome our examiners, how to uh, how to uh, maintain a good social life with mathematicians. We learned I learned a lot from him. Uh, uh, of course, uh, what I find extraordinary about him is that he was not the one who, who would be jealous of his colleague. Uh, once uh, when I was nearing the age of 70, somebody wanted to nominate me for a prize. And I went to uh, meet him and ask his opinion about it. He said, no, you should be nominated for the World Academy of Sciences. I said, sir, you have been my mentor always. First, when you will become uh, uh, the fellow of world academy of sciences then i will get then i will fill in the form and get myself nominated nominated and uh, you know what he advised me he says no now i you know i've crossed the age of 70 i cannot be fellow of the world academy of sciences you fill in the form and let us see what happens and on his advice um, I, I, I filled in the form and was nominated by my two former teachers, Professor Pasi, uh, Professor uh, Baba, and Mrs. Hanskin, and I was selected. So it, it, that kind of spirit he had, that he wanted his junior colleagues to be ahead of him, to to make progress in life, uh, um, and in spite of his extreme busy research career, he played a great role in the development of mathematics education in India. He was a, a, a member of National Board for Higher Mathematics for continuously 13 years. This board and he oversaw the implementation of various schemes leading to the uh, progress of mathematics in India. And he helped uh, in Mali as well as uh, department is parent department department of mathematics Punjab University Chandigarh from which from where he did his MSc uh, to progress uh, and to obtain lot of funds uh, uh, lot of funds for uh, for uh, mathematics library and for other purposes uh, he was uh, he was an institution builder I will say and uh, and uh, he was an institution builder. He not only played a great role in the development of the Department of Mathematics, Punjab University, Chandigarh, through his long and illustrious career, but also, in a way, set up the Department of Mathematics at Aysar Mohali. And he led, uh, uh, and he thought that Aysar Mohali will be a great institution and he led this by example what impressed me uh, about him most is that what impressed me about him most is his mentorship 
uh, his mentorship for students, not only for students, but also for his junior colleagues like me. I have never been his student. I have never been his collaborator. But still, he always, uh, he always uh, uh, sort of pushed me to do my best. And I think he played a great role in shaping my career, uh, 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 in shaping my career. Uh, with these words, I will say that uh, he, he was a very valuable colleague. With these words, I would say that his loss is a personal loss to me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Madam Khandija Khandoja, for your nice words. Yeah, thanks a lot. He has been really very, very caring and uh, not only for his students, for all his. Uh, colleagues and juniors, seniors, for everybody, he, he has been caring like anything. So uh, thank you, Madam Khanduja. Uh, may I request Professor Ajit Iqbal Singh to say a few words? Thank you. Who is so cool yet so warm? But be it teachers, students, or children from school, all know his charm. I thought in my mind 50 years ago in Kurukshetra, said 12 years ago in Chandigarh lawn of its own kind. I, in the hall, named after Professor Hansraj Gupta, and now walking down the memory lane. I repeat it in retrospect. Answer is the same as okay. Professor in the piercing Pasi with due respect. Memories are not logical, my friend, nor they follow any schedule. They come like waves with no fixed strength and not round and round as in a pool. We cannot group people in any unique way, but Professor Pasi could join any couple, stand out and comfortably sway. Different attributes can give different order, mostly partial with no single top in sight, but Professor Pasi could pop up and make it harder to find anybody above him as a right. It is difficult to be kind when you are on an evaluation spree, but Professor Pasi could do it with a smile and yet not budge with any key. Role model for so many of us to get down to brass tacks or any spike to give due respect to teachers and mentors, deep concern for students and others alike. Creativity is a must for good research, but that alone is not enough. Intelligence and diligence just as much to keep patience is equally tough. To read a lot and assimilate and work out every aspect and part to put in context and relate ex exposition to suit expert and youngers yet to start. Expand horizons, travel far and wide in the world, interact with experts and youngsters as well. Long visits do help. Substantial joint work. We just heard the greatest of the great Alfred Hale's tell. Continuity is significant. Periodicity is interesting as well. <clears throat> work in related topic makes you fresh to produce a new sequel. 
As an editor, I admire Professor Passi very much. Efficient dealing with standards in depth. It was wonderful to work together as such a lot in the process. I could go on and on with more rare ripples and gentle breeze. The urge to learn from you all grips me strong with fondness and intensity on increase. Thank you very much. My due respect, reverence to Professor IBS Pasi. Please continue to guide youngsters and friends and be with us in spirit. You will live in our hearts and you will live through your work. Thank you very much, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such a wonderful composition, explaining your feelings in as pure way as you are. You, uh, ma it's, it's a true feeling which you have explained. Wonderful, wonderful done, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, may I now invite Professor Ravi Kulkarni to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Professor Bakshi. Thank you, Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me to share my reminiscences of uh, Professor Bakshi. I heard about Professor Bakshi in the mid-90s as a very mature link theorist of India. But when uh, Professor Raghunathan suggested to me to join the Research Institute around 1999, he specifically mentioned to me that Professor Deependra Prasad and Professor Pasi were the uh, media mathematicians there, or uh, he was going to come there. In the year 2000, I spent a month at HRI and joined HRI as a director in August 2001. MSR had repeatedly mentioned to me that Professor Dipendra Prasad and especially Professor Pasi would help me on the industry side. Pasi was a mature and excellent friend. I came to know much later that he was also being considered for the directorship of HRI. So in most situations, a candidate who does not get a position develops a rivalry of jealousy towards the candidate who succeeds. But Pasiji was a big exception, not an item of rivalry or jealousy. In fact, such was his personality that anyone who came in contact with him completely felt at ease with him. Uh, and he would discuss in their problems or in their uh, situation. Depending on the occasion, Pasiji will guide, console, or participate in the person's success. I remember an occasion at HRI when two students got a job. I managed and Pasiji and Sridharji arranged a party to enjoy the uh, occasion. Both of them have become now uh, uh, very good mathematicians. Uh, I take a special note that Sridharji wholeheartedly would join and support all such activities and would add their own delicate touch. I remember the first of Bhattuari, which actually discussed Pasiji's personality. The standards in Sanskrit, I shall first uh, say the standards in Sanskrit and then explain it in But the original standard is very beautiful. Manasi, Bachasi, Kaye, Unni, Piyush, Puna, Vituvanam Upakara Shreni Vipreena Yanta Paraguna Paramanu Paraguna Kriya Nitya Nitya Vipreena Yanta So it says that there are very, very few people in the world with hearts filled with nature, always speaking gently, helping all open in their contact. And the last important thing, to magnify the small virtues in others, and silent about the whole world and enjoy the whole time of life. This was the first In retrospect, I truly feel that the Ramanath should have offered directorship at a time to him, rather than me, and invited me to join the faculty. 
I would have been happier uh, because one major issue that I faced was the teaching obligations of the senior faculty. I have always said that in research institutes in India, a faculty member should teach one course each semester. After my starting, uh, voicing the sentiment, uh, I think we did get a difference and faculty did start teaching more. Faculty at its institutes. But, uh, and Professor Pasi wholeheartedly supported me on this point. But administratively, this was a major change in the structure, which is far more experience in the university administration. Pasi could have handled it much more smoothly than what I, I could. Research administrative help in Pasi's presence, I renewed my interest in abstract groups. I had uh, come from a very different background. And our background just uh, fit each other nicely. And uh, in particular, I got interested more and more in finite groups. Two of my students did PhD in this field. Conversations with Pasiji, Baksiji, and the whole school which he has started in the country have helped me significantly. I would like to call Pasiji very I've said this on a few occasions before, and I say it again uh, this time. Uh, as an academic person, his personality has many dimensions. Besides being a proposed researcher in his field, but also an excellent teacher. He wrote many academic books in his research area and also very good textbooks. He also contributed to mathematical societies in India. He was chosen as the president of Indian Mathematical Society. And uh, he was the chief editor of the Journal of Indian Mathematical Society from 1985 to 1991. If you look at the journals before this period, you will notice many reforms he had brought in the whole structure. In December 2016, the Indian Mathematical Consortium recognized two people for their contributions to the mathematical community in uh, India. One was Rodham Narsimhan, and the other was Professor Pasu. Professor Pasi has many awards about his specific contributions. There are better people in the audience who speak about them. In passing, let me only say that in passing away of Professor Pasi, the mathematics in India has suffered a great loss and personally I have lost a very wise friend. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kulkarni, for your nice words going down the memory line, recalling the moments. It's hard to believe and I'm falling short of words to thank all the friends and collaborators of Professor Pasi who have devoted so much time on this event, preparing for this event. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kulkarni, for your nice words and recalling Professor Pasi's personality, which was unique, which all of us know. So I uh, thank you. Now, may I now invite uh, Professor Satish Bhatnagar from USA to say a few words. Okay, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Dear mathematical friends and relatives of Passy, that's the way I always addressed him. This talk being delivered in a mass webinar, it's incumbent upon me to integrate my recollection of Pasi as some kind of theorems in the humanistic history of mathematics, my intellectual passion for the last 15 to 20 years. Let me tell you that I did try to draw Pasi into history of mathematics. That was more than 10 years ago. But his interest remained limited to the reading of my aperiodic reflections. His full name is Inder Beer Singh Pasi. It has four parts which is quite uncommon, at least in the Hindu nomenclature, as prevalent in North India. 
Indra or Indra is the name of the most powerful god in the Hindu pantheon. Veer or Veer means brave. Singh symbolizes strength of a loin. Mathematically speaking, Pasi's legacy of his work in mathematics, in terms of the book he wrote, research paper he published, PhD students he guided, and administrative leadership he provided, is very, very robust. Thus, he lived up to the meaning of his name. That his parents or the family priest might have chosen for him. After all, what more defines a life other than the perpetuity of your name? Personally, my first name, Satish, means God of Truth. And that has been a mantra, a pole star of my adult life. I really feel honored by the invitation to share my memories about Passy. But it may surprise you to know that he and I had only two years in common. First at Punjab University, during 1959-60, I was doing MA part one and he was doing MA part two. We lived in the same hostel called number one then. The other year was at Kurukshetra University, 1966-67, when Pasi had just uh, rejoined after getting a British PhD, and I was in my second year of doing PhD in seismology. I really have no tangible recollections of our Kurukshetra days partly because of a perceived difference in mathematical achievements that we academicians suffer from time to time. However, at Punjab University, the story was different due to studentship. I look back at that period, the making of a mathematical temper. By and large, mathematicians of the caliber of field medalists have even temperament mixed with individual oddities. By the age of 2021, foundations of the emotional side of a persona are well set. In the hostel life of India of the 1950s, leg pulling was the norm, called hazing. One of Pasi's classmates was good at it. But Pasi minded his business of studies. Whenever he was made fun of, he would just walk away quietly. That is a sign of the making of a good mathematician, a good husband, and a good father too. I am sure his wife and daughters would bear it out. The fact of the matter is, that in mathematics, one cannot go too far with a yo-yo temper. Pasi remained mathematically active to the very end. In fact, I wrote an email just a one week before he died, that you can prove a theorem even in this life. Pasi completed 82 years two months ago. And I hope to do it after two months. I think we were married a few months apart too, with the most beautiful girls. However, life balancing balances it out. Sometimes it is easier to marry a beautiful girl than having to live with her for over half a century. For your information, I've been married since January of 1963. In pursuits of professional ambition, raising families and finding social platforms, our lives drifted and diverged apart. 
However, the internet and proximity of ideas, some ideas brought us closer 15, 20 years ago. By the way, Pasi's picture in the flyer says it all. On the one hand, it excludes the image of a peaceful and tended life. By the same token, Pasi seems to be endless to move on with our lives. His pain and suffering of the last few months are over. We are just a speck in the long, even for life that he led. Anyways, he has already moved on, on to a hyper plane of new existence. Rounding it up, here are the three theorems that have been proved. The theorems are on his name, his temper, and his identity. Also, I pose an open passive question. And that question is, how come after finishing his MA in 1960, Pasi did not join the math department as a research scholar, especially when he was not selected by the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Pasi lived in the research wilderness for one year when he went to teach in a relatively unknown national college in Sarsa. Perhaps Dr. Bamba alone may have an answer to it. Incidentally, in July of 1961, the then department head, Professor Hans Raj Gupta, offered me a research scholarship that I declined in 60 seconds. I wanted to join the IES. My response may have disappointed Professor Gupta, but he wished me the best. That moment in time and space is vividly etched in my memory. Finally, here is a call for action to the mathematical friends and relatives of Asi. It is raised in the same spirit in which we tell our students that mathematics is not a spectator sport. It demands active participation. Pasi and I were born and raised in educationally remote cities of Moga and Batinda, respectively. However, our lives have been enriched by mathematics far beyond our expectations. Even some of our dreams have come true. Therefore, befitting this occasion, I announce my seed contribution of rupees 100,000 towards the Indra B. Singh Pasi Research Fund to be established in the department. The sole purpose of this fund is to promote excellence in mathematical research by recognizing every year, if possible, the best doctoral dissertation chosen out of the dissertation completed in the span of five years. The cash amount of rupees 50,000 to 100,000 to go along with the award would depend upon the size of the fund. Nevertheless, this memorial award will inspire researchers to do high caliber research. High caliber means of the caliber of Nobel Prize field medalist. And that would raise the profile of the university in the country. That's all my way of a tribute and eulogy to my friend in the basing Pasi from University of Nevada, Las Vegas, the entertainment capital of the world the Indraprasth of USA, and more. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, thank Professor Bhatnagar, and thank you so much for your kind gesture, for your, in the memory of your friend, and uh, for your alma mater, Punjab University. 
I have passed on your message to Professor Dinesh Khurana for further action regarding the institution of this fellowship at Punjab University. And we will get back to you soon in that regard. And it's, it's very nice to hear from you. And when Professor Pasi expired, I got a very long message, a few pages long, from Professor Patnagar, sharing old memories of Professor Pasi, and which I did pass on to Monica and Erika, Professor Pasi's daughters. Thank you, Professor Patnagar. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So may I now invite Professor Adhikari for sharing a few words and then we will move on to the next academic session. Okay. Thank you. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Boxy, for giving me the opportunity to speak a few words. I met Professor Pasi for the first time <coughs> in March 1981 when I was visiting Chandigarh University for a month. That was the time when I had not started. Uh, I had not started research at that time. I was trying to learn few things. And though I met uh, several faculty members there, the academic discussion happened only with two of them, uh, Professor R. N. Gupta and Professor Pasi. <clears throat> now looking back, I find it more. That time I could not understand much. I could enter his room and ask something and he would give time and give references, explain few things. So he was such a senior person that time itself, but uh, just giving time for a very young student, I was really overwhelmed. And much later I understood more about that, that significance of that. Then this during four decades, I knew him. I always seen him encouraging, inspiring, the young students or younger colleagues in presence of him nobody can be is, is feeling some sort of depressed or anything academically so when he is he, i mean came to hri for during his stay for several years at hri gave me the opportunity to know him closely there were, of course, uh, social gatherings. I mean, he would often throw a high tea party in his bungalow in HRI campus. And uh, because HRI has only those who have seen one road to walk in the evening. So you, even if you don't meet someone in during the day, you have to <laughs> meet. So it was very nice. Always he was very cheerful. And <clears throat> now regarding this academic things and administrative things, I learned very things from him. If there is a meeting and people have various opinions, he will keep quietly his opinion, but he will not take side of anything. That way his opinion will be more valued than others. Because, okay. And there was one thing, it was in Professor Kulkarni's office in after one conference, there are three of us, Professor Kulkarni, myself, and Professor Pasti from there, and Professor Sastri and Jugal Barma. And that was the time when there was the idea of starting the AFS schools for national workshops for PhD students, junior PhD students. Now today, uh, the, it is taken up by some this institute, NCM. But that time it was for first five years to run, and okay. the Professor Pasi gave his full support, and he was in the committee in the first five years. Now these there are many many memories. Even after that, uh, he left HRI. We kept meeting in various conferences and visits to Chandigarh and Mohali. Sometimes occasional meetings in the airport where he is trying to, uh, he came to see of somebody and I am uh, waiting for some flight. And then always it was very nice to spend some time with him and talking with him. Okay. So this memory goes on and on, but what I can say that he will always, I mean, be remembered by the mathematics community and his memory will always be inspiring us. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Adhikari. So I think we are getting delayed for the next session. So I'll just request Professor Premji to say a few words, but be very brief so that we can move to the academic session. Yes, I was going to sign up because it's 1.30 right now here. I, I, I know, I know, yeah. No, uh, that's okay. I want to thank doctors uh, Dinesh Khurana and Gurmeet Bakshi and others who have spent a lot of time in uh, organizing this uh, memorial in honor of Dr. Pasi. While it's not under the best of circumstances, I'm grateful for the opportunity to connect with old friends, ones who I have not seen for many years. Sadly, I never had the honor of being in Dr. Pasi's class. By the time I started at Kurukshetra University, Dr. Pasi had already left for UK. When he returned, I had left for studies and life in New York City. I have heard a great deal of Dr. Pasi's love and concern for his students' growth as mathematicians and professionals. When I visited India in 2015, I have never, I have not visited since then. I had the honor of visiting Dr. Pasi, Pasi's office with Dr. Khurana. It would be repetitive to list Dr. Pasi's many contributions to the field of mathematics as they are well documented. Beyond those contributions, I know his students greatly appreciated his commitment to academia and his humility. Like Dr. Pasi, my mentor, Dr. S.T. Chopra from Kukshetra University was a remarkable, remarkable mathematician and a down-to-earth human being. Teachers like S.T. Chopra and Dr. Pasi are few and far between. And I would like to thank you for allowing me to share my ref reflections and honor the life and legacy of Dr. Pasi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Premji, for sharing your kind words. Yeah, thank you so much. And so we are moving to the next academic session. So I will request Professor Dinesh Kurana to chair the next session. Uh, thank you, Gurmitji. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Dipinder Prasad from IIT Mumbai. So he's, he doesn't need any introduction. So I'll just invite him for his talk, element-wise containment among representations of a group. He is also one of the collaborators of Professor Pasi, Professor Prasad. Uh, th thank you, Dinesh. Uh, thank you, Gurmeet, for this opportunity to say a few words uh, on this occasion and also give a mathematical talk. Uh, it was with great sadness that I uh, it was great sadness, or rather it was with great shock that I learned about the passing away of Professor Pasi a few weeks back when uh, uh, I got a call in the morning from uh, uh, Krishnendu. Uh, you know, I, I, I had been uh, uh, seeing Professor Pasi once in a while in these Sangam seminars. Uh, perhaps the last time I saw him was only a few months back. Uh, he was still attending the lectures and once in a while he would, at the request of the participants, uh, put the video on. So I certainly was not at all prepared and uh, it was a, with great shock that I got the news. And uh, I, still I have not come to terms uh, with the fact that uh, Professor Pasi is now no more with us. He was like a very close family to me, a close family, a close friend, and a senior colleague of mine, uh, whom I had uh, known for many decades. I would say uh, I got to know Professor Pasi uh, since my days in Allahabad at HRI, he was uh, in the council of the institute uh, 
when I joined HRI uh, in the beginning of 90s and uh, later he moved to HRI in late 90s and we had many years together and uh, uh, he, as I said he was a close uh, family for me and I used to visit his home in Allahabad uh, without an invitation uh, many times and I see uh, Madam Pasi is here and I would like to uh, reach out to her to say that uh, you know, I always think about them and about her. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, I think Professor Pasi came to HRI in 99 and uh, he spent five, six years uh, at uh, Allahabad. Uh, I myself uh, left uh, Allahabad at the end of 2002. So we still had about three or four years together in Allahabad. And uh, uh, but in any case, I used to come back to Allahabad. And uh, after he moved back from Allahabad to Punjab, I used to come to uh, Chandigarh. And I would say that uh, over the years, I have acquired many friends in Chandigarh. Uh, and I think uh, the point of uh, my contact, my link to uh, uh, all the friends in Punjab has been Professor Pasi. So over the years, I have, uh, you know, made friends with Professor Hans Gill, Professor Madhuraka, Professor Khanduja, uh, 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 Gurmeet and uh, Dinesh, who are younger than me. Uh, so, uh, and of course, Professor Bamba uh, is somebody who is uh, 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 also friendship I have had, who is kindness and who is, uh, uh, blessings I have had. I think uh, this all, uh, I think all my contacts to Chandigarh uh, go, uh, I think, via Professor Pasi. So I think in passing away of Professor Pasi, you know, I have really uh, lost, uh, you know, I, I feel a little disoriented if I come to Chandigarh, uh, you know, uh, uh, because uh, he was the person whom I always will look up to. You know, I mean, uh, I always uh, told him that, you know, uh, I'm coming and I would like to meet you. And he would often invite me to his house. And, uh, uh, you know, it was always uh, uh, with uh, such a, uh, a familial feeling that I had coming to his home and uh, meeting him, talking about his family and, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, Madam Pasi was always very, very, uh, I, she also treated me like a younger brother. So, uh, yeah, I feel uh, very uh, sorry about it. Uh, I should also add uh, that for the moment, I am in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, uh, where Professor Pasi had uh, uh, one of his uh, proteges, uh, in Roman Mikhailov and I met him yesterday. So in fact, uh, I get the feeling that he also is in a similar state of shock even now. He says that, uh, you know, in some sense, Professor Pasi had uh, groomed him uh, over the years. He came to Allahabad as a postdoc and they wrote many papers together. And uh, he said uh, he is traveling today, so he cannot attend the memorial meeting, but he requested me to, uh, to, to tell everyone that how much uh, he misses the presence of Professor Pasi and how much he owes his own career to Professor Pasi. And uh, in fact, uh, next year he is one of the ICM speakers and he said that he is going to dedicate his paper to Professor Pasi. So uh, as we have been hearing there, uh, every one of us who has known Professor Pasi feels that, you know, I think uh, we have lost a very close uh, friend, somebody with whom uh, we could interact without uh, uh, much hesitation and uh, somebody who was always kind. I think he also has played a lot of role, uh, I should also add, uh, since... Uh, 
I was at HRI with him for many years. He has played a lot of role in uh, developing uh, HRI. And later, uh, also, from what I understand, he has played a, quite a bit of role in uh, I, I Sir Mohali. So, no, I think uh, because of his uh, kindness, because of his stature, because of his uh, contacts, I think uh, uh, he, he has played a large role in uh, development of mathematics. And, of course, because of his own mathematics. Okay, so I think now... Uh, uh, I am also expected to give a mathematical talk, which I will give. It is about representation theory, a subject to which uh, Professor Passi has uh, ha had great love for. And uh, I think he would certainly have enjoyed this talk. Uh, so, uh, so I speak in his memory today on this topic. So, okay, so I need to share. Uh, is this uh, visible, Gurmeet? Yes, 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 it is. Yes, it, is. it uh, looks okay. Uh, uh, the visibility is all right, and the audio is okay. Uh, yes, yes. All right. So uh, this is a talk about uh, representation theory. Uh, it is, in fact. Uh, motivated by uh, some considerations in number theory, which I may or may not come to. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, the representation theory is what I want to begin with. Uh, OK. So uh, the, the talk is about introducing a certain relationship among representations of a group. Uh, for representations, for two representations, V1 and V2 of a group G, define a relationship. V1 uh, is immersed in V2. So I uh, use this notation. V1 uh, not contained in V2, but immersed in V2. If for each element of the group, the set of eigenvalues of the action of the element on V1 counted with multiplicities is contained in the set of eigenvalues of G acting on V2 counted with multiplicities. So therefore, if V1 is a sub-representation of uh, V2, then of course V1 is immersed in V2. And uh, somehow the talk is uh, uh, whether uh, being whether being immersed uh, is uh, similar to being uh, a sub representation. Uh, Dipinj, can I ask a quick question here? Yes, yes. No, I think it may help uh, to. Uh, uh, so if if uh, an eigenvalue is repeated five times in V one, then in V2, it needs to be repeated five or more times? Yes, Is yes, of course. Mean when yes. you're, when yes. you're saying multiplicity? Indeed. Okay. No, uh, counted with multiplicity, indeed. So, like, the like, uh, trivial element has uh, uh, eigenvalue repeated dimension of uh, V1 times, and it should appear in V2 uh, as dimension V2. So, that looks good. Yeah. That was uh, Gita, is that? Yes, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah, by now I can uh, recognize people by their voices. Okay, good. So uh, this is a relationship among representations. And uh, 
Yeah, this arose naturally, as I said, in some context in number theory. Uh, and then I have been thinking about this as an abstract group representation question and uh, um, uh, to see, uh, so as I said, uh, uh, representation V1 is immersed in V2 if it is a sub-module or it is a sub-representation. Dipendra, can you do full screen, please? Yeah, yeah, we can do full screen. Yeah, I think uh, the problem sometimes with the full screen is that I lose uh, contact with the audience. Uh, but uh, I think the other thing I can do certainly is to increase the font size. Yeah. And uh... yeah, that's better. That is better. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I guess the concept is very clear. Uh, uh, so I begin by uh, doing a few warm up cases. So if V1 is immersed in V2 and they have the same dimension, then V1 is isomorphic to V2 as G modules as they have the same characters. So, you know, the character of a representation is the sum of uh, uh, diagonal entries, which are the eigenvalues of the element. And since I am saying that the eigenvalues counted with multiplicities is the same, they have the same character. And then it's a theorem in uh, group representations that if two representations have the same character, then they are isomorphic. So, okay, we are always doing things over complex numbers and finite groups for the moment. Okay. And there is one more trivial case in which this uh, conclusion continues to hold, which is that if dimension of V1 plus 1 is equal to dimension V2, so they are just one apart in terms of dimension. So then also, if V1 is immersed in V2, implies V1 is a submodule of V2. Uh, this is because the representations on the two sides of the equality below have the same character. So you can, uh, so V1 has dimension one less than V2 and uh, there is this character. So given any representation of a group, you can look at the determinant, which is a character on the group and uh, quotient of two characters is a character on the group. And therefore, this is a one dimensional representation of the group. And, uh, and uh, these two have the same character because, uh, you know, the eigenvalues, uh, if for V1 are alpha 1, alpha n, and for V2, it is alpha 1, alpha n, and then alpha n plus 1 then somehow alpha n plus 1 can be written as the product upon the product. And uh, therefore, uh, in this case also, V1 being immersed in V2 implies that V1 is contained in V2 as a representation. And uh, therefore, uh, is somehow the notion that we are trying to understand, at least in some simple cases, seems to work as if it is just a submodule. Uh, but somehow, uh, perhaps one would say that uh, 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 the next proposition in which I construct an example uh, is suggests that maybe it is not something as simple as being contained in V2, but something more complicated could happen. And still uh, uh, V1 could be immersed in V2. So here is an example, uh, which I have stated as a proposition, by, but it is only an example. It is uh, um, uh, example based on GL2 of a finite field. Uh, I should say that, uh, you know, when one is doing representation theory of uh, finite groups, uh, 
uh, in some sense, there are two main finite groups that one should always think about. One is the symmetric group, which is a very large subject. And the other one is a GL2 or GLN of a finite field. So I think if you understand these two groups well, I think uh, uh, it gives uh, one a good uh, understanding of uh, how representations of finite groups work. Okay, so this group GL2 of finite field have representations which are very well understood. And uh, uh, so, Let's see be an irreducible cuspidal representation of GL2 FQ of dimension Q minus one. Uh, and P be an irreducible principal series representation of GL2 FQ of dimension Q plus one. So, you know, the principal series representations are obtained by inducing from a character on the group of upper triangular matrices. Uh, and since G mod B has order Q plus one, their dimension is Q plus one. And uh, then there are these uh, cuspidal representations of dimension Q minus one. So this, uh, of course, I knew very well. And uh, yeah, then you assume that the central characters for the cuspidal and for the principal series are the same. You know, I could have taken it for PGL2, then it would automatically be the same. But I just wanted to uh, be a little more general. And I... I uh, took a more general central character. Then it is a fact that uh, C is immersed in P. So, you know, this has dimension Q minus one, this has dimension Q plus one. So there is a hope that it can uh, sit there. And uh, uh, basically, uh, I don't know a very intelligent way to prove this, but since I know the representation so well that it kind of became, it was obvious to me, although, uh, I think the proof itself will uh, be involve in saying that uh, uh, the, uh, any, any element of GL2 FQ, uh, let's say it is uh, either diagonalizable or it belongs to what is called a, a quadratic field extension, or it is a unipotent element. And I check it one by one on all of them. And uh, it's not a large check. It's more or less something which uh, one can do in one's own head. Uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, here is a nice example of irreducible representation for which there is a immersion. And obviously, it's not a submodule because P is an irreducible representation. So we cannot write P as C plus something. Okay, so uh, given this, uh, it looks like a natural question to understand this question. Uh, you know, what does being immersed as a representation mean? And uh, to construct more such examples and uh, to uh, uh, know in a specific cases what is going on. So as I said, uh, if the dimensions are equal or they are one apart, there is nothing to be said because uh, uh, it is all uh, quite easy. So uh, I think uh, uh, most of my lecture is devoted to the case when the dimensions are two apart. Sir, I... And... Uh, even in that case, as you saw that in the GL2 of a finite field, uh, there is a counterexample to an obvious expectation. Yes, sir. So, yeah. Uh, sir, I have a question regarding this proposition. Proposition, okay, good. Yes, yeah. yeah, sir, uh, we know that if a representation is a principal series representation, then it would not be cuspidal representation. True. So C is not contained in P. So yes, of course. The, the whole point of the lecture is that this relationship of uh, a representation immersed in V2 is weaker than being a submodule. And yes, this proposition yes. is uh, constructing an instance where you have a representation which is uh, uh, 
looks element wise contained but not as a group so you know this is the title of the lecture uh, element wise sub representation so for each element of the group uh, uh, the, 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 there is a containment but not for the whole group yes sir yes. okay sir. so you see that is one of the miracles of the character theory the character theory says that two representations are the same if the characters element wise are the same and uh, you know i think uh, uh, each one of us uh, uh, sometimes thinks about these basic issues you know uh, how does it happen that element wise implies that it is true for all elements at the same time so uh, uh, this one doesn't happen okay so the aim of this work is to understand the relationship v1 emerged in v2 in the first non trivial case where the dimensions are two apart so uh, uh, let us formulate the following questions so question 1 let g be a compact possibly disconnected lie group of dimension more than 0 and then the question is to classify triples of irreducible representations pi1 and pi2 of g for which pi1 is immersed in pi2 such that g acts faithfully so you know this is to avoid uh, you know very some uh, trivial kind of constructions uh, and the dimensions are two apart so you know okay uh, question 1 is this and uh, the more relevant question for this lecture one might say is uh, this question about finite groups let g be a finite group classify triples of irreducible representations such that g acts faithfully and the dimensions are two apart so we already know one case in which uh, uh, there is a non obvious example okay so as i said uh, the answer to these questions have a di direct bearing on some questions on automorphic forms which is where the questions arose uh, perhaps i may say something but uh, given the occasion and given that there are a lot of people involved maybe i will restrict myself to pure group theory okay so uh, in fact these two questions have been uh, you know it's the same question one for finite group and one for in, uh, compact infinite groups and uh, one might uh, if one uh, um, uh, did not uh, know that uh, in general uh, compact lie groups are much easier than finite groups uh, one would think that uh, question 2 is easier than question 1 but in fact question 1 is the one which is much easier and uh, so in fact uh, i can answer question 1 completely as long as the group is not kind of abelian group okay so here is the final uh, proposition i have not called it a theorem because it uh, doesn't seem uh, worthy to be called a theorem it's very kind of uh, simple and the theorem says so let g be a connected reductive algebraic group over complex numbers uh it is the same as uh, just assuming uh, compact groups so somehow um, uh, it is uh, for no particular reason i use this language connected reductive algebraic group where i could have just said let g be a connected compact co compact connected group and let pi1 and pi2 be two finite dimensional representations of g with pi1 immersed in pi2 and the dimensions are two apart then uh, only the following options happen one is that pi2 is pi1 plus direct sum of two characters of the group g so you know if they uh, so it is a case in which pi1 is uh, in fact a sub module of pi2 in this case one pi1 is a sub module of pi2 but then there is a case where it need not be a sub module uh, okay so i have made a definition here in the following proposition we call a connected uh, a reductive group uh, q 
as i said connected reductive groups are same as compact groups compact connected groups are uh, type a1 if uh, its derived group is either uh, uh, pgl2 or sl2 or in more common language it looks like u2 u2 or su2 or so3 and so on so uh, somehow the simplest uh, mm, compact groups or simplest reductive groups so the okay so part 1 says that uh, either pi1 is contained in pi2 and there are two characters uh, which are there or g has a quotient q of type a1 so uh, the g has a quotient which is uh, su2 or uh, so3 or something like that and pi1 prime pi2 prime are irreducible representations of q of dimension d and d plus 2 and then there is some other finite dimensional representation pi of g such that uh, pi1 is this direct sum that and pi2 is this direct sum that so okay so maybe uh, okay uh, so the thing is that just like i have a counter example for gl2 of finite fields there is also a counter example for su2 for the compact group su2 uh, maybe i say that a little later so maybe i will just uh, yeah okay yeah yeah so uh, the proposition says that there are no relations pi1 emerged in pi2 among irreducible representations of a connected simple algebraic group with dimension 2 apart other than the obvious ones for sl2 or pgl2 uh, or su2 or u2 etc in which pi1 is symmetric d minus first power and pi2 is symmetric d plus 1 power so these are uh, known to be irreducible representations of sl2 or gl2 or su2 and so on and these are distinct irreducible representations and therefore uh, pi1 is not contained in pi2 but it is immersed so uh, you see uh, a, a, any element of sl2c uh, if you forget the unipotent element any element of uh, no su2 has anyway no unipotent element su2 all the elements are diagonalizable and they look like t comma t inverse on the diagonal and if you look at sim d minus 1 then the eigen values will be t to the power d minus 1 t to the power d minus 3 going up to t to the power d minus uh, minus d minus 1 and for sim d plus 1 it will start from d plus 1 then d minus 1 and then go on to minus d minus 1 and therefore you see that for each element uh, the eigen values of pi 1 are contained in the eigen values of pi 2 i hope uh, this e example is uh, i am able to usually highlight something uh this example uh I, you know i am just saying that uh, uh, in in uh, sl2 if you look at diagonal element t comma t inverse and you look at the symmetric power then the eigen values in the symmetric power are given by t to the power d minus 1 and then t to the power d minus 3 dot 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 t to the power minus d minus 1 and for sim d plus 1 they start from d plus 1 then d minus 1 dot 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 minus d minus 1 then minus d minus 1 and uh, therefore uh, from the point of view of eigen values pi2 seems to contain pi1 but uh, in terms of representations one knows that uh, pi2 and pi1 are irreducible representations and therefore there can be no containment okay so the proposition two that i have it here proposition two that i have it here says that uh, in some sense the only way to construct a counter example of uh, 
the difference of the dimension being uh, 2 and pi 1 is not contained in pi 2 is that these representations factor through some SL2 and uh, these are then representations of SL2. So if you have a counterexample for a group G and G prime has G as a quotient, then you can lift the representations of G to G prime to construct counterexamples for G prime. Okay, so can I ask a question? Uh, there is some question or query. Can I ask a question here? Yes, so, yes, of course. These ones. Uh, so, the, so this says that for irreducible representations, you will not have any such right pair. Is that correct? I am saying that among irreducible representations, uh, this uh, this weaker relation of immersion holds only in the case of. Uh, SL2 and all the other examples are constructed by uh, taking a quotient of your group as SL2 and lifting this uh, symmetric power on SL2. Mm -hmm. So there are some cases. So, okay, so uh, uh, somehow it is a bit curious for me that uh, proposition one had this counterexample for GL2 of a finite field using cuspidal and principal series. And uh, uh, for connected, uh, compact connected groups, also proposes, so then it's a theorem or proposition that uh, the only way you have uh, immersed representations which are not uh, uh, contained are through GL2. GL2, yeah. So is there something that you were thinking for GLN, FQ also? Things yes, like yes. So uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, is this Puja that is talking? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, good, good. No, <laughs> yes, thank you. No, I am, uh, I am hoping that uh, uh, some people will uh, uh, be interested in this lecture. So, uh, indeed, you will see some of what I have to say. Okay. Uh, okay. okay so, you. the following corollary follows by an application of Clifford theory. So, you know, in the previous proposition. Uh, I was looking at a connected group, connected compact group or connected reductive group. And uh, in this uh, corollary, I am now looking at a general group, which, uh, which is uh, not necessarily connected, but its connected component is non-abelian. And uh, then one is saying that uh, in that case also, uh, there are no counter examples, uh, only examples are constructed. In, uh, using uh, S S SU2. Okay, so uh, now I make some comments about the finite group case. In the case of finite groups, we do not know if they are irreducible representations, pi one immersed in pi, pi two with dimension pi two minus dimension pi one equals two besides the examples provided by GL2. So, I have not spent too much time trying to find uh, more examples. But in any case, I want to make this comment that perhaps it is not so common to have simple groups with irreducible representations which are uh, dimension two apart. So even without the condition that pi one is immersed in pi two, maybe there are not too many examples. But uh, this I am not sure. So, so in any case, I do not expect many examples beyond GL2. But in any case, it would be nice to, uh, just like uh, the proposition in the compact connected case, where one could prove that it must uh, come from GL2. Uh, uh, I do not have any, any thoughts on the finite group case. Okay, so here is an important comment. One of the difficulties in trying to use the condition pi1 immersed in pi2 is that it is not clear that it can be represented in terms of character theory. So, you know, character theory, <clears throat> so pi1 and pi2 have their character theory. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, if the eigenvalues are uh, contained in the eigenvalues of pi2, I wonder you know how to think about that in terms of character theory. I mean, 
<clears throat> you might recall that if they are uh, equal dimensional or if they are one apart, then we did use character theory to make conclusions. But, uh, but in general, uh, I am a bit lost here. However, if uh, there is a immersion and they are two apart, then there is this relationship uh, uh, which uh, one uh, easily verifies. It may take some thoughts to discover it, but having uh, discovered it to check it is not difficult. Uh, pi 2 tensor pi 1 plus these are the uh, determinant characters omega 2 by omega 1 is equal to exterior 2 pi 2 plus symmetric square pi 1. <clears throat> so both sides being representations of G of dimension. So n into n plus 2 plus 1, which is n plus 1 whole square. And uh, <clears throat> pi 2 is the larger representation and it's exterior square. So n plus 1 into n plus 2 by 2 into n into n plus 1 by 2. So one checks that these dimensions are the same. And uh, one checks that uh, element wise, this is true. And therefore, uh, now the character theory can be used. Uh, so sir, uh, so you are saying that when pi 1 is emerged in pi 2 and dimension of pi 2 minus dimension pi 1 is equal to 2, then we can use character theory. Am I right? No, as I said here, <clears throat> pi 1 is immersed in pi 2, they are two apart, then we have this condition, which is a necessary condition, because this follows from that. Okay. Uh, which can be checked by a character theory, although I'm not sure it is necessary and sufficient. But it could be, I mean, uh, I am not sure about that. Okay, so uh, uh, there is this uh, <clears throat> a much uh, weaker question that one can try to in investigate. At the other extreme of the relationship, pi 1 immersed in pi 2 is when pi 1 is equal to 1. In this case, the question amounts to classifying irreducible representation pi 2 comma v, say of the symmetric group Sn, which have the property that every element fixes a non-zero vector. So this is certainly something, Puja, you can think about. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this I mean, I mean, uh, and small examples. Uh, so, uh, question is that uh, every element of the group has one fixed vector, whether the whole group has a fixed vector. Mm -hmm. I so okay, so I can, uh, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> in fact, it surprises me that I have not seen questions of this kind addressed at all or raised in the literature. Okay, the best situation to happen, of course, is that pi 1 is immersed in pi 2 implies pi 1 is contained in pi 2, not only among irreducible representations, but all representations of a finite group G. Uh, you know, I think irreducible representations need some more classification and all that. So it is better if one can just... Uh, a hope to do it for all representations. And uh, okay, so here is another question which I raised. Perhaps this is true for all symmetric groups that you don't need irreducibility. Maybe being immersed is equivalent to being uh, embedded, meaning a uh, submodule. So I have not tried thinking about what groups besides cyclic groups have this property. Uh, today morning, <laughs> I thought uh, I will do this for symmetric group on three symbols, but uh, I have not succeeded. Okay, fine. So uh, <clears throat> then I make some remark about dimension pi two minus dimension pi one uh, more than two. Uh, Okay, uh, so I already said that uh, in the compact connected case, the so to say, the only way to construct immersed representations which are not submodules is uh, sim d minus one and sim d plus one. Uh, these are irreducible representations, so they cannot be contained in each other. 
but uh, of course you know i put uh, this condition dimension pi 2 minus dimension pi 1 equals 2 just to begin the investigation it was for no fundamental reason so without the constraint on the difference of the dimension being 2 there are naturally many other representations uh, but uh, one would like to see, you know so here i have said uh, that maybe for certain groups, uh, pi 1 immersed in pi 2 implies pi 1 is contained in pi 2. And if that were the case, then uh, uh, this can never happen that pi 1 is immersed in pi 2 among irreducible representations. Uh, so he here is a uh, kind of a beautiful example. Uh, uh, you look at exterior K of Cn and sim K of Cn. And this is also one example in which uh, uh, pi 1 is immersed in pi 2. Because, you know, if you think in terms of uh, basis, a basis for lambda k cn is given by e1 wedge e2 wedge ek, no, e i1 wedge e i2 wedge e i k. And a basis for sim k is given by e i1 tensor e i2 tensor e i k. So, uh, it looks like it is contained there, but of course these are irreducible representation and therefore there can be no containment relationships. So, and of course the dimensions are far apart and uh, so, you know, I don't know whether, uh, you know, in mathematics, if you think about a certain phenomenon, you want to understand whether it is typically the case that such things happen or it is rare that it happens. So for me, uh, pi 1 immersed in pi 2 among co connected simple algebraic groups, uh, I have no feel whether uh, there are many pairs for a given group where it happens among irreducible representations or uh, there are just uh, select few examples. Okay, so this is what it was. <clears throat> okay, so I indeed want to say another well-studied question. So here is a question which my group theory friends would uh, perhaps recognize. If G is any finite group, it is a consequence of character theory that if two homomorphisms are conjugate for all G, then in fact they are conjugate on all of G by a fixed element. As I said, you know, you know, if you just want to think about this question in just uh, uh, without using a theory, I mean, this looks impossible to me. I mean, for each element you are getting conjugation and then how are you going to get con conjugation for the whole group? So this concept may be called uh, locally conjugate versus globally conjugate. And uh, I, this is a very well studied question. But uh, this is however specific to GLNC and if we have some other group, even PGLNC, uh, it is not true that locally conjugate implies globally conjugate. Uh, so I know uh, in the audience, uh, we have Pooja Singla and I also saw Sumana, who is also one of my collaborators. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a lot of study of what is called projective representations and uh, character theory fails in projective representations and this fact is not true. Locally conjugate doesn't imply globally conjugate. And uh, instead of uh, uh, GLM, you could have some other group GC or uh, I don't know what happens if you take homomorphisms from G to the symmetric group. Our locally conjugate implies globally conjugate. I have no feel. 
but in any case i am just saying that it is an interesting and a well studied question at least for certain groups and our question could be said to be a variant of this question but now even for glnc there seems to be counter examples uh, so of course uh, one is glnc and one is glmc okay so um, i may have still some time you, you know so uh, 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 in fact just to convince you that uh, the proof of uh, this proposition for compact connected groups is uh, really elementary i so this proposition uh, that uh, in fact uh, this is quite elementary and i want to give you uh, the proof uh, okay so you know um, i think uh, uh, the key words one uses for uh, compact connected lie groups is that there is a notion of a maximal torus and there is the notion of the wild group so these are the two important uh, objects which allow you to understand representation theory of a compact connected lie groups and uh, uh, clearly pi1 is immersed in pi2 so you know this is element wise condition but uh, somehow the point is that all elements of the group g can be conjugated to an element of the torus and uh, therefore uh, it is just as well to study the restriction of these representations to tori so you know i am reminded of uh, because i have uh, i see that there are many young students also in this audience that for finite groups you know there is a well known observation that there is no proper subgroup which contains the conjugates of all elements but that is true for compact connected groups that uh, you, you can just look at diagonal entries in S, uh, su2 and they contain uh, one conjugate from each conjugacy class okay so pi1 is immersed in pi2 if and only if the weights so weights of pi1 for the torus t are contained in the weights of pi2 since the weights are supposed to be w invariant if pi1 is immersed in pi2 and the difference is 2 we see that uh, there is a set of two weights of t which is pi2 minus pi1 there are two weights there which is w invariant and uh, basically the proof amounts to saying that uh, the only uh, uh, elements uh, only uh, weights or only characters of t which are w invariant no uh, for which the w orbit has two elements is either the w orbit has one element or it has two elements and if the w orbit has uh, one element then it becomes uh, uh, a direct sum with the character of the group g and if it is two elements then it is not possible if the group is larger than su2 so maybe i don't want to give details but uh, but i think okay i mean uh, just to summarize uh, the point is that the here the main players are there is a maximal torus which contains each conjugacy class and it's an abelian group and there is the normalizer of the maximal torus called the wild group and uh, uh, the immersion relationship means that uh, the representation restricted to t is sum of certain characters and all the characters are the same except two and uh, these sets are w invariant so you will have a set of cardinality 2 which is w invariant and uh, 
the, let's say the while group is a symmetric group. So if uh, a symmetric group on n symbols operates on a set with uh, two elements, then obviously you will say that uh, that uh, it, it, there is no option except that it is uh, uh, GL2 or GL3. Because uh, no, a, a symmetric group on the only symmetric group which can operate, I'm getting, a, yeah, a symmetric group on three symbols can happen. Symmetric group on three symbols operates on a set with uh, on of two elements, but, uh, uh, nothing beyond that somehow operates on a set of two elements and uh, uh, somehow that argument can be bootstrapped to do it for all compact connected groups. Okay, so uh, then uh, <clears throat> in the next half of uh, this, I have said where the problems come from in number theory uh but maybe i don't want to go into that so perhaps i end here but i am happy to take questions yes uh, thank you professor prasad for this wonderful talk so if there are any questions professor prasad will be happy to answer this yeah i have a, I have a may i ask yeah so uh, if uh, pi1 is immersed in pi2, can we expect some relationship in the simple components of rational group algebras corresponding to these representations? Yeah, no, I, as I said, uh, I mean, somehow in terms of character theory, I was not able to make any relationship in terms of group algebra also. I have the feeling that uh, I mean the group algebra are a bit uh, uh, removed from eigenvalues, no? Yeah, I am not uh, uh, say one way or the other, Gurmeet. Um, uh, but anyway, you know, I'm what I'm saying is that. Uh, the uh, it's element wise it's a sub representation that uh, you know the eigenvalues are sitting in the eigenvalues of the bigger group element wise and now we want to say whether the whole group wise it is true okay okay so i am this this is a big question like can we think of some relationship between that i don't know it's it's a vague question so so maybe uh, yeah no i mean uh, Mm, uh, yeah, so, uh, okay, maybe I stop, no, but I may have to go back. Uh, yeah, just to say that, um, uh, you know, I have uh, come to these questions only recently, and uh, I feel there is some uh, uh, abstract group representations uh, which this can give rise to, and which would, it would be of interest to understand. Dipendra, will you be sharing these notes? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to share the notes, uh, Ravi Rao. Uh, I can uh, send it to you personally, or uh, if uh, Gurmeet Kaur I is just Gurmeet is better, because she will do that also, no problems. In, in some ways, uh, uh, I always uh, make uh, notes of my lectures, and of course, this is uh, uh, quite a complete note that I have made. And uh, I'm happy to uh, yes, share it with yeah. Meet and I uh, with Ravi Rao. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you. So, any other questions or comments? Yeah. Hello. Uh, yes, Ashish. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, you were talking about the symmetric groups. Uh, is there a classification of uh, finite groups where being immersed and being sub representations are equivalent? You made some no, you see, uh, as I said, uh, uh, somehow uh, today morning I was thinking about this question for symmetric group on three symbols, but you know, I think uh, mathematics needs pen and paper, and uh, somehow I did not uh, uh, complete that. I think uh, 
it is uh, perhaps easier to think uh, in, uh, for all representations and not for irreducible representations. It would be better if the phenomenon is true for all representations of certain groups. Okay, thank you. But uh, as you say, as you see that, you know, uh, GL2 of finite uh, groups, uh, I have constructed counter examples. So obviously it will uh, show up in small groups also, you know, uh, I don't know what is the smallest GL2 of finite field uh, for me, which my counter example will work. Uh, typically, I like to work with Q uh, not to, but uh, uh, I think uh, my friend uh, Shiv Prakash is there. He might say whether uh, my proposition work, uh, one works for GL2 of F2 or not. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I am not certain. Okay, so let's thank Professor Prasad for this wonderful lecture. Thank you, Professor Prasad. So, I can see Professor Radha is uh, present with us, although it might be very late at where she is. So, Professor, Professor Kesar, would you like to share your memories of Professor Kashi? I, I suppose he was your teacher also. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, of course, it's a great loss for um, all of us in many ways. Um, uh, he, uh, Dr. Pasi is um, leaving us. Yeah, so I've known uh, Dr. Pasi in many, many uh, ways because uh, I knew him when I was a little girl growing up in Punjab University. Um, one of my best friends is, is the daughter of Professor Luther. Um, and so um, whenever there would be any uh, parties at the Luther's house, uh, uh, Professor Parsi and Mrs. Parsi were there. So, uh, you know, I knew them through that. And then when I did uh, BSc honors at Punjab University, I had the extreme good fortune to be taught by Professor Parsi. Um, especially, uh, yeah, theory of finitely generated modules over principal ideal domains, uh, Hartley and Hawks. I learned that so well uh, because of his absolutely uh, superb uh, style of teaching and clarity. And uh, it's really, I mean, yeah, uh, I think that one uh, course, you know, it's still, it's just still, you know, so so useful for so many things, and yeah, he was remarkable in many ways. And then, all through my years when I went uh, to, you know, studying mathematics and doing mathematics, I had constant interest and support from him. And um, yeah, so it's as other people have said, he was really a role model, not just in his absolute. I mean just total devotion to mathematics, uh, but also in the way he was towards everybody. Gentle, understanding, and um, yeah, I guess we all have to just try and emulate uh, emulate his characteristics. And I hope, well, uh, we can, at least I can, to some extent, follow in his footsteps. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor Pesce. So I see Professor Bamba is also present with us. Professor Bamba, would you like to share some thoughts about Professor Parsi with us? Yeah, it seems uh, we don't have a connection with Professor Bamba. So, so okay. So in that case, I would like to. Yeah. Uh, Professor Bamba invite... is on the yes. online. Yes, yes, yes. So in that case, I would like to invite Professor Ravi Rao to share his thoughts. With us. Professor Rao, can you hear us? So Professor Rao seems to be present, but uh, uh, 
not able to get uh, connected with him. So, okay. So, Professor uh, Verma, Professor Jugal Verma, are you there? Yes, yes, oh. Dinesh. Yes, yes. So, Verma, please yes, share your thoughts and memories about Professor Pasi. You have also had a very long association with Professor Pasi. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dinesh, and uh, thank you, Gurmeet, for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. I hope I'm uh, audible. Yes, you are. Yeah. So it's it's rather difficult uh, for me to believe that Professor Pasi is no more. I felt very sad when I heard it. Uh, it's a great loss for all of us and a great loss for mathematical community in India and abroad. He was such a great source of inspiration for all of us in uh, so many different ways. He touched the lives of uh, hundreds of people, students, collaborators, colleagues, and family friends. Uh, it's, it's difficult to find such people. Uh, Professor Pasi got his PhD at University of Exeter in 66 under the supervision of David Rees. And I have a connection with David Rees because all my work uh, is inspired by uh, his work. Uh, I met David Rees uh, at his 80th birthday conference celebration in Exeter. And uh, he invited me to his house and told me if I knew Professor Inderbir Singh Pasi. And I said, he is known to everyone in India. And uh, we all love him for his work and uh, the, the man he is. And then he replied, he said that uh, he was one of my best students and the most handsome person he ever met. So we all know uh, so many qualities concentrated in one person. It is a very rare occurrence. Uh, my association with Professor Pasi goes to many years. Uh, explicitly in 2003, uh, I started uh, discussing with him many things for uh, improvement of mathematics in India. And uh, first time uh, I was going uh, with or morning walks with Professor Kulkarni, Professor Aya Shastri and him in the beautiful campus of HRI. Uh, we would walk for a long time early in the morning after a morning cup of tea and Professor Pasi would throw questions to all of us and ask our opinion about how to improve the state of mathematics in India. And we came out with many ideas. And we, we thought that uh, we will start inviting students and teachers uh, from all over India to HRI every year. Professor Kulkarni was the director of the institute at that time, and he immediately called a meeting of the whole faculty and uh, proposed this idea that HRI should become a center for uh, learning for all university uh, teachers and research scholars throughout India and uh, become a catalyst for improvement of state of mathematics in India. Well, we uh, could not agree to make HRI as a center, but it gave rise to another center, which we all know now it is National Center for Mathematics. So, uh, I, in retrospect, uh, thank the community uh, of mathematicians and HRI not to agree to our proposal. So it, it created a new institute. And Professor Pasi uh, kept on pressing us that we should make a presentation to DST and uh, uh, you know, start these programs uh, with their funding. And Professor Kulkarni uh, then I think he, he invited the DST committee to HRI and uh, I flew to Allahabad at one day notice and made this presentation. But for some reason, uh, DST rejected our proposal. And in retrospect, I see that it was a good thing that it was rejected. Because the next day we met Professor Raghunathan, uh, who was visiting HRI for a council meeting. And he said that, uh, present it to NBHM and we will support it. So in the next meeting of NBHM, I made the same presentation and it was, it was approved without any discussion. That's the way two, two government agencies can look at the same proposal and come out with different conclusions. 
and that was the starting of ATM schools. And then I, I called Professor Pasi immediately, said uh, that uh, NBHM has accepted our proposal. Now, what is the next course of action? He said he will organize the first school. He took on uh, upon himself the organization of this one month long school for uh, PhD students, first year and second year PhD students from all over India. We received a uh, large number of applications and uh, uh, we ran this school. Uh, the how to run such a school was completely the ideas. It was a culmination of ideas of Professor Kulkarni and <laughs> Professor Pasi. Uh, there were so many interesting things which happened during that foundation school that that school became a kind of prototype for all such uh, succeeding schools. Now that we have about 10 foundation schools every year. So you see how much he cared for development of mathematics that uh, he could bring people from different uh, you know universities and institutes together and start a program which can make an impact over a long period of time it was his vision he always said that make a long term vision and execute it with perfection he, he was a perfectionist I, I i collaborated with him for in organization of three programs and i could see that he would pay attention to the smallest possible details and make the entire program as a learning experience for everyone present there, not just for the gifted students in the crowd, but for everyone present there. Uh, so I really miss him, uh, you know, for so many things that he did for for state of uh, for development of mathematics in India. Professor Pasi was president of the Math Society, Indian Math Society, in 2006. And uh, during that time, uh, he, he proposed that he would like to visit IIT Bombay and uh, plan a program for college teachers in, uh, at the intersection of linear algebra and group theory. He, he told me that uh, these subjects are taught at, in, in, uh, as, as like separate subjects in universities. You know, when it is group theory, linear algebra is avoided. When it is linear algebra, there is no mention of group theory. And he wanted to change that. So he mixed these two things and we emphasized a school uh, for teachers where these two subjects came together in the form of matrix groups. And it was such a memorable uh, program that we did together. I, I got to know him uh, as a person uh, in a much better way because we had lunch together every day at IIT guest house and then he, he I asked him you know what what is he doing about the uh, annual conference of Indian Mass Society and he said he's not happy uh, with the with the way the Mass Society meetings are arranged it should be more professional like the European Mass Society or American Mass Society which brings large number of mathematicians together and here our society meetings have hardly 100 people or 150 people. So everyone doesn't um, go to these conferences. How to change that? So we discussed a plan. And you'll be surprised that uh, we listed 20 symposia to be organized under his presidentship. And in his symposium, we listed 20 speakers. And so we had a list of 400 confirmed speakers with us. And Professor Pasi traveled to Pune and submitted, he was the president of the society, he submitted this list to the academic secretary. Once again, the proposal was rejected. Because the, the I think the society got a bit nervous about uh, doing a conference at such a scale. You know, we, we don't have such huge facilities to have, you know, uh, accommodation for 400 people and so many 20 seminar halls, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So they rejected this proposal and I still have a dream that we do such a conference. In fact, we have done such conference when we got together with American Mass Society. The, I, I remember the Bangalore meeting had more than 500 uh, delegates. So we can do it. If some outside challenges, we can do it. But let us do it ourselves sometime. And I hope that we will do it with the association with Punjab University and have a major physical meeting where we honor uh, the works and memory of Professor Pasi. For Professor Pasi uh, pursued many areas in mathematics uh, 
and uh, his work is uh, admired by uh, everyone. Uh, but one, he told me that he has been pursuing group theory for such a long time, but it is the geometry group theory uh, which should be pursued by young researchers because it is the geometry group theory which brings together so many subjects in mathematics. And uh, it, we, we should have workshops uh, to, to educate our young researchers in geometry group theory. So then I, I said, OK, let us do it at IIT Bombay. And he again visited IIT Bombay. We uh, had this wonderful meeting where algebraists and topologists and analysts, everybody you can think of, people in combinatorics, they all came to IIT Bombay and lectured on geometry group theory. It was such a memorable experience. And once again, I, I, I could see how much attention he paid to the organization of uh, this meeting at IIT Bombay in geometry group theory. Professor Pasi, of course, he was always doing mathematics and uh, guiding people his students and his uh, junior colleagues and uh, other people. But he was involved in administration, administration in a non-trivial way. Wherever he was, he uh, did some wonderful things. Uh, even after retirement, he joined Aisar Mohali and uh, played a very important role in bringing up this department. We all remember Aisars were created, several Aisars were created, but the manner in which I said Mohali math department came up is really remarkable how we could attract so many good people to that department. And I, I used to uh, go to Chandigarh to participate in uh, various activities of uh, I said Mohali math department like curriculum development or selection of faculty. Uh, and once again, he organized a workshop at I said Mohali and called the education secretary of Punjab government. And he, uh, he invited several mathematicians and other people to this meeting. And uh, he asked us to give him ideas about how Aisar Mohali can play an important role for development of mathematics in Punjab state. We had several suggestions given to the education secretary uh, about how to do this. Uh, so you know, Professor Pasi was constantly involved in uh, wherever he was, whether it was Kukshetra University or Punjab University or Aisir Mohali or later Ashoka University. Uh, he, he was concerned about development of mathematics in the immediate vicinity uh, and also at the national level. Uh, so we are all grateful uh, to him for his vision, which inspired so many of us to participate in execution of his vision. He was a great role model for all of us in so many different ways. Uh, and above all, he was a very gentle human being. Uh, I, I don't think anybody can forget his first meeting with him. He, he, was, he was such a caring person who inquired about uh, how we were doing and, uh, and uh, talked to us. Although he uh, spoke uh, very few words, but whatever he spoke was so useful and uh, uh, so impressive for all of us. He cared deeply about people around him and we will uh, miss him uh, so much. Uh, it's a great loss of uh, uh, to, to all of us. It is impossible to uh, express in words. So with these words, I, I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to speak. So thanks a lot, Professor Verma. So indeed, we'll miss we all will miss Professor Pasi a lot. He has touched so many lives. So one of the person whose lives he has touched in a very great way is his grand student. He is present with us, Man Manoj Yadav. Manoj, kindly share your thoughts with us. Uh, thank you, Dinesh Ji. Uh, uh, actually, some uh, PhD interviews are going on. Uh, right now here yeah. so i could join just i think just 10 15 minutes uh, before so i missed uh, the proceedings of the whole morning but anyway uh, so as i think has already been said uh, professor pasi was a great uh, human being a mathematician uh, overall academician and uh, i say that he for me he was like a father fatherly figure he is a supervisor of uh, my supervisor and so as uh, Dinesh Ji said, I am a grand uh, student of, and comes in this third position. Uh, 
maybe it's the second position perhaps is after one morning. And my first meeting uh, with Pasi sir was in uh, 1999 perhaps in Punjab University when he was at UI. I have also said this um, um, incident in some other activity. So uh, me and uh, my uh, senior Deepak Umbar, we went to Punjab University for library consultation. And so we just had an idea, why don't we go and uh, see Professor Pasi? And we, I never met him, we met him before uh, that uh, date. So we just uh, dropped uh, to the DUI office outside and we were stopped by the, uh, the PN there. And PN said, okay, we have to, you have to write a cheat. If uh, he calls you in, you can go. So we prepared a cheat and gave it to the PN. So PN came back very quickly and said, okay, you won't go in. So we both went in and we had no idea what to say. So he said, oh, oh, come, come, oh, can I say, oh. So when he just like uh, expressed or like that he, he knew us, but perhaps he was uh, seeing us uh, first, first time, but he only knew that I am a student of uh, Burmani and uh, um, Deepak was a student of Ramkaran, other student of Burmani. And he was very, very friendly. And I was actually very, very impressed by the first sight, a very tall and broad person sitting on a big chair on a platform, uh, because I had no idea about his personality. So I was very much impressed by his personality, and but we didn't have anything to say, what to say. Then we just cooked up an idea. Oh, Varmani sir has sent you greetings. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, good, good. Uh, he was here uh, two days back. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we were then speechless and said, okay, sir, yeah, yeah, we are all fine and we have come to visit the library. We just left, left that place. But that was a memorable uh, uh, visit and this was the first visit and the impression which I got uh, about his personality uh, was never actually faded and it actually, uh, what is I should say? I mean, became more and more bright when I came into contact uh, with Pasi sir in my later years. The second visit was in uh, HRI in uh, 2003, and after meeting uh, Pasi sir in 2003, my life started change, changing. And because at that time I was, uh, I don't know, I perhaps finished my PhD, but I was on. Uh, I was uh, on the scholarship SRF and he told me to apply at HRI. So I was reluctant. And Professor uh, Kulkarni was the director of HRI uh, at that time. He asked me to meet Professor Kulkarni uh, and uh, apply uh, for a postdoctoral position. Uh, I said I have only three small papers in a, this normal journal. He said, no, don't worry. You have done good work. You apply. I forgot that he was the external referee of my PhD thesis. He had an idea what I have done. So I applied and then I joined HRI. And so then I I was with him for more than a year, maybe a year and a half. And I learned a lot from him. Unfortunately, I could not learn group rings. He gave me uh, some thesis of uh, Martin Hartwig and he wanted me to read that thesis. But uh, unfortunately, uh, I found it uh, very difficult. And I tried it for a couple of months and then I gave up. So I, I said, I, I cannot, I cannot uh, complete this. Then he said, no problem. You, you do, uh, maybe continue with your uh, PhD topic. And, but he was always there. And he suggested me a very good problem, the bounds on the conjugacy classes, which uh, I finally popped. Uh, that solved that problem and that was my first uh, influential uh, some kind of substantial work in my opinion which i could come up so anyway this was about uh, my my relation so he was like my uh, like father grandfather and whenever i felt any any kind of doubt in my life academic non-academic i always look forward that okay no problem i will ask Pasi. And uh, I have done it uh, numerous 
number of times. Any problem, just made a phone call to Pasi sir. He was always available. And that's the thing which will be missed uh, now. Uh, so he's no more, and so there is no substitute actually. And, but anyway, we have to survive and, uh, and survive according to the teachings he has already imparted uh, to us. And uh, as has already been said, uh, he was a perfectionist and he always wanted us to do, do whatever, small or big, do it with perfection. In with the discussions, he wanted me to write the sentences with perfection. I mean, I am very good at making first of things and just uh, uh, write uh, very minimal things and just go ahead with creating confusions. But he taught me, no, no, it is not a right, right thing to do. Uh, do it properly. And the, he gave a mantra to me. Maybe he also gave this mantra to many, many people who came in contact. Learn something new every day. When you are doing research, that is of course a new thing, but also if you want to broaden your horizons of knowledge, learn something new every day. So, so that is the mantra which I have not been able to bring into practice, but uh, I try and I think that is useful for everyone who should do that. And, um, he was a very, very practical person. I want to share one incident. So, practicality, not in, only in mathematics, but in the life as a whole. He asked me uh, something. Uh, we were, I think, Gurmitsi and I in Moscow uh, for some activity. And uh, so, he wanted me to. It was Tuesday. And he said, This Tuesday, I will not eat eggs uh, because uh, I usually keep fast on Tuesdays. And said, okay, okay, oh, so then you also, uh, this ancient, the Arti, yeah, every Tuesday I do that. He, okay, he, tell me what is the name of uh, Hanuman's mother. I said, sir, I'm <laughs> being a beer of no mind. I said, I know his mother's name is Paman, but I don't know. He said, in this Arti, there's a name, Anjali, Anjana. So then I just... Uh, <laughs> So, so they were so practical, I mean, and uh, um, there are many more incidences that, uh, I have had uh, dinners with him at his home so many times with uh, Madam and him and also at other places in nature, I, many places. So there are certainly many other things uh, to mention, but uh, I think um, uh, I stop. So, yes, so can, can I add to what Manoj has said? Yes, yes course, he sir. would say he, he would say have a mantra for a day, for a week, for a month, and then for a year. <laughs> so this is how he used to I mean guide have a list for day, for a week, for a month, for years, for decades. I mean he, he was such a planned person. He was that kind of a planned person. Right? Yes, exactly. Thank you, Gurbiji. Now, uh, I see Professor Rao yeah. again with us. Uh, Professor Rao, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So would Sorry, you like... Oh, no, no, no problem. So would you like to share your thoughts with us? About... Uh, I'll talk for a couple of minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the organizers, Gurbiji, and for giving me this chance. I joined TIFR in 1976, and I was keen to work in group theory or complex analysis. These are the two subjects I really had fallen in love with. And I had uh, read many books in group theory, not so much in complex analysis, but uh, that was my aim. But then I go there and find, I didn't find group theory much of it. Nor did I find much of complex analysis except for Professor Simma, who told me that don't do it, it's a very hard subject. Okay. So, in the end of it, I decided, now what do I do? But uh, I had heard of Punjab University being good in group theory, even at that time. Professor Bamba was a big figure, the lion 
so to say, at that time. And uh, Pasi's name also I had just about heard because he had written many books. Some of the books that she mentioned, uh, connected generated modules so appeared. He has exhaustively covered so many topics like that. So I was curious to see him, and I luckily got a chance in 1979 and 1980 to go to Chandigarh. You know, I went by the helicopter. In those days, there was a helicopter going from Delhi. And I was so scared. I can see the pilot. And such a small flight. But anyway, I reached Chandigarh and then was warmly greeted at the airport by Professor Pasi himself. Okay. And he comes and takes me and we go for the meeting. There was a meeting on uh, making a examination paper of a particular type, you know, something like a special paper. I had gone for that. So then I had an idea, which I was due to a paper I had received when I was a student. I had this uh, paper in which Morley's theorem, because take home, 10 questions were asked and we were to do in a week. And Morley's theorem was asked by, I later on learned by uh, Venkatachara Ayengar. So he had asked, you know Morley's theorem? Morley's theorem is beautiful. It just says that if you have a, any triangle, and you take the equilateral, I mean, you take the trisectors of each angle and take the one points meeting nearest to the sides. And if you join those three points, that's an equilateral triangle. It's a very beautiful thing. It was very inspiring. And so I felt any paper we give, any paper we give for a general exam should have something beautiful which will attract the students and not be very technical. Maybe hard to prove. We were given a week. There was no internet that day. If you have internet now, we can find proofs. So I told them that idea. Let us try to give questions, given the steps of the proofs if required, and make them work it out so that they know the proofs. For example, I said fundamental theorem of algebra. I didn't, uh, actually, we didn't put fundamental theorem. I gave some four or five examples. Fundamental theorem of algebra is just done by, uh, you know, uh, two variable calculus, basically. You can do it. And you give them the step. Give them the steps and let them work out each step. This way, the whole thing comes. Pasi liked that. But I had some other colleagues there whom I did not know at that time. They were very furious. They were very furious. They said, what do you mean? You just come from TFR, so you think you can tell us whatever you want? That was the reaction. And I was a young guy, as you can see, 24 or so, and totally shocked. But he, it was amazing to watch him. He was the chair of that session. He calmly dealt with them. I would not have been able to imagine that. In TFR, we have to protect ourselves. Nobody comes to our rescue. And I was just preparing to answer, but he did it so nicely that I learned many things just by that first interaction. So beautifully, the way you can handle people without ruffling any feathers. You know? In fact, many years later, when I was the dean in TFR, these same people came by a, a common friend, grower, to say that their pension is having problem, can you help? And of course, with the help of grower's ideas, I managed to help them get their pension back, full pension. They were getting pension, but not getting the free pension. So I felt justified, to, okay, I learned something from Pasi. I really learned something. And that is what one has to do, learn from such big people. I had many interactions with him on many occasions. Last one was about a month ago on email. On email, we frequently talk. His advice to me was, Ravi, you should go around the country more. Okay, And I think Ravi Kulkarni also has similarly tried to encourage me to go around. But somehow, I am not finding it so easy these days. And it is so much easier to pick up the phone and talk. I sit at home, I talk to people in St. Petersburg. I sit at home, talk to people in Kerala. Okay, it's so much more easier. I can do mathematics sitting at home. So nowadays, it is not so important. And my last physical meeting with him was in China, where we were walking on the Great Wall of China. We had gone for a conference, 10 of us from TIFR. Pasi, Dani, and me were three in one group. 
And uh, I can't imagine, this is about uh, 10 years back maybe. He was so fit. He was working way ahead of us. Dani and I are struggling to keep up with him. And I was the worst in the lot. So Pasi was absolutely fit. And I just can't believe this news. You seeing his fitness, seeing his clarity of thinking, no muddle, nothing. I just can't imagine. Even today, I am just totally unable to face that uh, group theorist group has you know, suffered a massive blow. <coughs> the algebra group has suffered a massive blow. And we are not going to be finding it easy to uh, recover from that. He has great faith in Gurmit. So Gurmit, you have got some work to do now. Okay, you have to take the mantle and carry forward his ideas. So he has great faith in many of us. Jugal mentioned some things. Okay, and always encouraging. Always encouraging. There was not a single time that he has discouraged me. Though Gurmit mentioned that he discouraged, he didn't discourage, he was like a family member. So in her talk uh, in Russia, she mentioned that once he scolded her. <laughs> I, I think that was a that was just a direction. And it's wonderful to get a person who gives you the right direction. It's wonderful. I didn't have the fire. I have heard his talks very well prepared and well done. But I have not had the time to study uh, with him. But his books at younger age I have read and I recommend also. So people can read it more. It's not known in the rest of the country. It's more or less on North Indian books. Now, India, that's the problem. There are very good books. The books in Calcutta are very different. The books in South are very different. The local books. They should be spread out a bit more. Maybe, you know, these books can be printed by the Ramanujan Mathematical Society, which are good. And after they have been gone through carefully, many books are bad, so it's a job. But they can try to do something like that. So I won't say much more except that this man has done so much for others that it's time for us to also do something for the country. And that's what he would like. OK, thank you. Thank you, Professor Rao. So indeed, Mr. Parsi has done so much for so many of us. Yes. No, no doubt about that. Right. So we have another uh, grand student of Professor Parsi with us, Suganda. So I have a grand student. You also have I it. Ask, I forgot to say that I began with a student of Pasi called Bud Nashir, who came back to Kurukshetra and died recently. And I ended with another student, Sampak Sharma, who was a student of Pasi in Mohali. Okay, and he wrote a paper on group theory. He wrote a paper on group theory, which Pasi liked very much. I sent it to him. The statement we proved is if you take SLR of rx rx is a r is a local ring polynomial extension of that modulo er rx this is always an abelian group if the size is at least three so we oh. do this huh? it's a beautiful nice. theorem right by itself but anybody can understand it and uh, we proved this theorem i sent it to passi because it's a group theory problem i knew you would immediately like it we also discussed the orthogonal group where things are not always a billion, but uh, can be uh, nilpotent to some extent, at least in the fiber. OK, sorry. Okay, thank you. you. Thanks, thanks. OK, Suganda, would you like to share your thoughts with us? Of course. Uh, thank you, Professor Khurana, for this opportunity. And good afternoon to everyone present here. I'm Suganda Maheshwari, and I work at Aizal Mohali, which I joined um, as a postdoctoral fellow of Professor Pasi. After submitting my doctoral thesis under supervision of his favorite student, uh, Professor Gurmeet Kaur Bhatri, who is also a key person to organize this uh, webinar meeting. Uh, thanks a lot, ma'am, for uh, bringing his mathematical community uh, to this platform. My memories of uh, Professor Parsi go back to the days when I was uh, a student, an undergraduate student at the uh, Department of uh, Mathematics. So. Uh, um, we always heard of him. He was a renowned mathematician by then. And we used to study from his books also. And just meeting him or, you know, interacting with him was no less than a dream, which uh, came true for me when he was on one of the panels uh, in an interview. 
and i still remembering i remember hearing a good from him on a certain step of mine and i actually had these bumps as a student that time so that was my first interaction and then i had more interactions during my phd work we had more meetings we had more discussions and that's when where uh, my teacher student relationship began with him which only grew later and i'm very grateful for that so all these years i was uh, pri privileged to be working with him i learned various lessons from him not just mathematics but life uh, everything about him was so admirable um, and i related so very well to what uh, uh, professor yadav said uh, everything that he said was so relatable some of his sayings uh, keep echoing um, at all the apt times so he always mentioned this thing do everything but research is what will keep you going so never ignore that always increase your horizon and in the mathematics he always used to say look for most trivial and most non trivial cases or examples and one thing that he often used was uh, don't use big guns to shoot the small birds and my personal favorite one was sab kuch bhool ke bhi jo yaad rahe that's what you have learned so that is the level of understanding he wanted to have for mathematics whatever concept uh, you learn it should be up to that level and of course there were many more um, uh, to the one that uh, professor bakshi mentioned uh, plan your work and work your plan is something that he always uh, you know encouraged us to um, follow and that's what he followed himself so i will uh, miss having more of listening to him having discussions with him having green tea with him and uh, you know meals also uh, sharing car rides at times i never realized i'll lose all these moments and regret not having uh, pictures uh, of uh, these moments and also regret is because of the pandemic i couldn't uh, meet him for a very long time so as i said i'll always remember him as a a celebrity he will always be a celebrity for me so with every publication of mine i used to go to him and to have kind of a you know encouragement for myself or reward for myself i used to ask for his autograph on his monographs um so the it really hurts to uh, realize that i won't be able to reach out to him in his office which was just next to mine so anyhow he has lived a wonderful life and his journey is admired by one and all so i'd like to take this opportunity to read out few lines that i wrote for him a couple of years ago and i even read a couple of times for him already but this time it will be in past tense just an amateur writing nothing close to what uh, professor ikbal said this morning so um, i'll just take two more minutes if you can uh can you see my screen uh yes yes suganda it's coming so, uh, yes this was for expressing my feelings to him on uh, one of teachers day occasion his presence had charisma and magnetism that taught us a lot more than isomorphism because teaching was not his only virtue discipline humility and passion to name a few fellowship or award or any prize he inspired only to rise and rise he never bound limits and set his students free to think of finite or indefinite like a sea to write or to edit or to review one thing was very clear in his view work could be multiplicative or trivial a note or a book or a research article excellence is utmost essential what else could be expected as ideal to his work he always stayed faithful used primitive ideas got them rational his research then witnessed augmentation this is how induced new dimensions a person who had touched the greatest heights yet the tone of his voice was always light a great person inspirational researcher and an ideal teacher of course none other than our passi sir thank you yeah 
Thanks, thanks, Suganda, for these nice, nice lines. Right. So as Professor Dipinder Prasad also told us in the morning, it will take a lot of time to come into terms with this reality that Professor Parsi is no more with us. So it will take some time to sink in. Right. Thanks, Suganda, once again. So we also have uh, Professor Vinita Verma, one of Professor Pasi's colleagues here at Punjab University with us. Professor Verma, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm very much there. So, so kindly share your thoughts. Yes. Thank you, Professor Dinesh Khurana, Professor Gurmeet Kaur Bakshi for giving me this opportunity to speak on this platform. Words are not enough to express our feelings and our gratitude for Professor Pasi. Uh, he never taught me, I was never his student. My association with him has been of a colleague. And as far as I know him, over all these years, what I have seen, besides being an efficient, besides being a wonderful, excellent mathematician, he, has, he, he was a very wonderful person in his life. He was very pious, truly dynamic, very positive. Every time, whenever I saw him, I saw him with a smile on his face, be it delivering an address in a conference or in a casual meeting or any conversation, always there was a smile, always. And he had an aura around him. There was a light he carried around himself, emitting so much positivity. And it gave me a very nice lesson in my life. At least I tried to follow. I don't know how much it will be further. That yes, try to have positivity, at least on face. Andar to pata nahi kya kya chalta hai sabke. And keep a smile on face. That smile was really... That, that taught us so much, of course. And he was a person who would pull anybody climbing a ladder of success. He would give his arms to pull that person, irrespective of whether it was a student or a faculty or a senior or a junior. He was a very, very kind-hearted soul, a very rare soul indeed. We all bow our heads to this great personality. I, I want to share a small experience with you people. Once I was coordinating a conference on optimization models and machine learning. I'm a person basically from optimization techniques. And he was invited as a chief guest. And in his note, in, in his address, on the keynote address, he spontaneously built such a beautiful, wonderful example of optimization, explaining the concept and the application of that topic to everybody and inspiring everybody. It was just wonderful. Means I could not think of such an example, which was totally different than the stereotype examples we have in this real world about optimization we find in books and otherwise also we can think of. It was beautiful. So uh, according to me, how we can remember is that we can follow, we can try to develop all those qualities he had in him and are missing in us. And if we do that, he'll be living but with us every thank you okay thank you professor verma so so anyone else if anyone else likes to share his memories his thoughts with us is welcome i can see professor kanan has just uh, joined us so professor kanan can you hear me No, he uh, seems he's not able to be in touch with us. So, okay, so in case there are no other ones uh, uh, ready to share the memories. So let's uh, 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 call this off now for now and we'll meet again at uh, 6.30 p.m. Thank you very much for being with us for so long from 9 a.m. till this moment. Radha Kesa, it must be very late at your place. What's the time? What's time? No, there? actually, it's very early. So the it's meeting started at uh, five o'clock for me in the morning. So you started at five o'clock. Yeah, 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 so. yeah. Because I'm four, uh, I'm four and a half hours behind India, in London. Okay. So, so Gurmeet ji, should we yeah. stop then? Okay. Yeah.
thank you all thanks special thanks to speakers professor prasad professor hales and there's one more talk uh, at 6:30 pm in the evening so hope to see you, some of you at least some of you there right. thank you very much thanks. thank you thank you very much for organizing this thank you gurmeet and dinesh bye So welcome to this evening session and very warm good evening good afternoon good morning to all of you uh, we feel sad when we realize that professor pasi is no more with us however uh, we have pride when we recall that he has great work and great memories left behind and uh, we are looking at both of these aspects his work and some of the fond memories which we have with us so uh, we have our speaker of the evening is leo margolis from institute of mathematical sciences uh, madrid spain he's a budding young grupringer whose work is greatly influenced by professor pasi's work on units in group rings and let's hear from leo in his talk on the unit group of a group ring Leo, yes, thank you a lot. I hope you hear me and uh, I will share my presentation. I hope you see it now. Uh, not now. Yeah. No. Not as yet. Yes or no? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Beginning. Okay, great. So, um, no, no. Yeah, thanks a lot for, uh, for giving me this chance to speak. I'm very honored to speak in. Honor Professor Passi also on this set uh, occasion. And I cannot say that uh, I met Professor Passi so often. I met him two times. I think the first time was during my uh, first year of PhD when we had a group ring conference in Stuttgart in my home university. And uh, I don't think I spoke with him then. I was also very young. But he was a very impressive uh, figure with a very strong aura, I would say, which I felt uh, also then. And two years ago, I had the chance to go to Bangalore to a beautiful workshop organized by Gurmeet and Manoj. And uh, then I spoke also more with Professor Passi, also about mathematics. And the last uh, few years, we also had sometimes contact by email. And it was always very nice and very gentle. And um, I never worked with him actively on mathematics. I have worked with a grand student of his with uh, Suganda, Maheshwari. Uh, so I decided to speak in this talk in the indirect influence of PASI, so the mathematical influence on my work. And since it is uh, present in many areas of what I, I did and what I'm still doing, I decided not to concentrate on one particular topic, but to speak on general th more things, so on several things where he influenced me. And because of this, this is work of many people, basically all I did in my life, with Andreas Bechler, Andrzej de Rio, Florian Eisele, Nima Stanakowski, Diego Garcia, Jota Janssen, and others, which incorporates some work which we just started this year and some more years ago. And, uh, well, the object which I'm studying, and which also Professor Passi mostly studied, is a group ring. Uh, so in my setting, the group G will always be finite. Of course, this can be removed, this condition. Uh, but for me, it will be finite. Also, for Passi, it was often infinite. And by R, the not a commutative ring. Uh, this will not be a crazy ring. This will be an integer, maybe, or some field. And as most of you know, uh, the group ring, which I denote by Rg, uh, of the group G over the ring R, is, uh, we can say, the free R module of basis G. Or if you're not such algebraically uh, sure, just think of a vector space where the basis has names from the group G. So you have such sums with some coefficients coming from the ring, some new more elements of G. So you have natural in addition in the structure like in a free module, like in vector space. And because your base is at a multiplication, you can extend it linearly, distributively, naturally to this, to this ring, Rg, uh, starting from the base G. And well, the group ring uh, it's an object also important in other fields of mathematics for group theory, ring theory, I don't know, in that topology, topology it's sometimes used in the knot theory, it's sometimes used for correcting codes, but all these things uh, I will write in applications, but the reason I really care is uh, that it's just an interesting object, it's a nice, there's an interplay of these algebraic structures, which is very beautiful to me, 
and which I like to study because of that. And uh, there are many interesting questions and problems still to be solved. And uh, there are several people in the audience, in particular Don Tessman, who uh, wrote great books on this topic, and also Passy wrote, of course, books on this topic. So there's a lot to do. And the basic questions, let's say, which I study, are here. Uh, those are not particular questions. And uh, so let's denote by U of RG the unit group of our grouping. So the elements which you can invert. So the unity in the group ring is the unity of R times the unity of G. And if you think about the unit group, then you think, well, maybe this is a complicated thing. It often is. And how do those units look like? <clears throat> we mostly have no clue. But there's one class of units where we know where they look like, where they're easy to construct. I mean, the group G naturally embeds in the group ring. And so you have the elements G in there, which you can invert by multiplying by G inverse. And if you multiply this for unit from the ring, you still stay a unit, and these are easy to construct. So these are the trivial units. And there are some how main questions, which are not mathematical questions, but a bit philosophical, semi-mathematical, semi-philosophical. So the first is, what is the connection between G as a group and RG as a ring. So if you have some knowledge about the structure of G, do we, what do you know about the ring structure of RG and vice versa? And the second kind of question would be if we concentrate not on the whole uh, group ring RG as a ring, but on the unit group as a group. What do we know? What is the connection between G and this unit group? And the third kind of question is that if you think about the unit group, maybe all the units are trivial. This will mostly not be the case, but maybe they're kind of trivial, whatever this kind of means. So this is a third kind of question. And I want to speak today about one topic in each of these uh, great bigger questions, about one particular question, some which I had studied some years ago and some which I just studied, uh, started studying recently. And I mean, like a Great theorem would look like this, no? And RG, if this is the cause of the reality, that RG is commutative if and only if the group is abelian, if and only if the unit group is abelian. But if you would prove something like that in a not trivial setting, you replace commutative by some other property and this abelian by some other properties, it would be a great theorem. So this would be the ideal thing that you have a ring structure pro property if and only if you have a group structure property for G, if and only if you have a group structure property for the unit group. But mostly we can not do it that great, but sometimes we can hope to do it. An instance for such an answer in specific situations would be given by a theorem of Graham Higman, who was the one who started all this uh, business, one would say, in his PhD thesis. So he proved that uh, when the group G is abelian and you take a unit of finite order in the integral group ring, then this unit is trivial. I mean, there are no other units of finite order in the integral group ring in that case but the trivial units. Serums like this are very nice and would be great to have. And uh, I will now go to the three particular questions and show you how Professor Passis worked and influenced what, uh, what we did there together with my collaborators. So the first question is that which appeared. So what is the structure of G? How is it connected to the structure of RG as a ring? And in this case, uh, the influence is in the other way. So if you know something about RG, what do you know about the group G? And the maximum you could hope for is that you can recover actually the, the isomorphism type of G. So this would be the maximum knowledge which RG would have about G. So if you would have isomorphic group rings of two groups, G and H, say, and um, the question is, do you can you deduce that also the groups G and H will be isomorphic then? Of course, if you ask it in this generality, uh, then it is too easy to show, say no, of course not, because if you allow the things to be, the field in particular to the big, to the coefficient ring to be very big, let's say the complex numbers, then the information which it carries is not that big. So for example, if G and H is a billion, the only information which the complex group algebra carries over G is the order. So you would have immediately counterexample to this general question. Uh, but in some other situations, uh, this question, which is uh, called in the book of Donald Pessman, the ultimate question for groupings, are uh, more interesting. For instance, uh, the question asked by Higman, also in his uh, thesis, if you would have isomorphism of integral group rings, uh, will you have isomorphism of the group basis? So from the theorem I showed you of Higman, you could say yes for abelian groups. But in general, this was, was open and not known to Higman. And another formulation was given by Richard Brauer, in a survey paper from 1963, 
was that if you have such an isomorphism of group algebras over all fields at the same time, uh, do you have an isomorphism of the groups? And these were uh, questions that were studied, and in particular this integral question was studied a lot over the decades. Let me give you a few results which were obtained. So the first result was this result of Higman, that the integral isomorphism problem is true if the group base is abelian. Later, Wittkamp showed in the 60s that you can also have this answer for metabelian groups, by which I mean you have an abelian group. Uh, sorry, you have a group where you have an abelian normal subgroup, which you can cut out to get an abelian uh, quotient. And the breakthrough result was given by Ron Camp and Scott in the 80s for important groups, or for example, by Schimmerle in the 90s for super soluble groups. So there are several results, there are more results, I'm just showing a few of them. I cannot go into details on any topic today. But finally, both of these questions uh, were answered negatively. Uh, the first one, the question of Brauer, <coughs> uh, was answered by uh, Everett Date in 1971. So we constructed two groups of order p to the six, q to the third, when p and q are some primes, which satisfy some mild congruence condition, which is easy to satisfy. And he showed that these groups, which he constructed, uh, have isomorphic group rings over any, uh, over any field. And finally, an answer to the integral isomorphism problem uh, was given by Martin Hertwig. It was also mentioned this morning uh, by Manoj, and that uh, Passi asked him to study this counterexample of Hertwig, uh, which is written in his thesis. Uh, the thesis is also in German, so it was more, even more complicated to study. And uh, so Hertwig constructed two groups of rather big order. Here it's stated 2 to the 21, 97 to the 28, derived lengths 4, such that the group rings were isomorphic over the integers. And because the integers are the universal ring, if you have an isomorphism of integral group rings, you will have an isomorphism of group rings over any coefficient uh, ring. So kind of, if you have no restriction on the group, then you will have a negative, general negative answer to the isomorphism problem. But you can also ask yourself what happens in certain, certain situations when you restrict uh, the group. And one famous formulation, which was partly also, which was also included in Brouwer's survey, but I think it was also maybe circulating before, was if you take a finite p-group, so G is now a p-group, not just any group, and you can study the group algebra over the field of characteristic p, and again you have an isomorphism of group algebras, and the will you have an isomorphism of the group basis or not. And so this was also studied uh, by several people over the decades. I'm just giving a few results here, and even if you don't uh, pay that close attention, you will see that this group listed here are much more specific than the one I listed uh, on the slide before for the integral case. And so the results here were more technical often. So it's true for abelian groups, for instance, uh, the results from the 50s already, or metacyclic groups, so we have a cyclic normal cycle with cyclic quotient, or elementary abelian by cyclic groups, so elementary abelian normal cycle with cyclic quotient, both result of Baginski. Or an important result of Sandling, that if the potency class of the group is, is maximal 2, and you have an elementary abelian derived subgroup, you will get a positive answer for groups of order at most p to the 5, it is true, uh, where the groups of order p to the 4 were handled by Pessman and p to the 5 by Salem and Sandling. Or to show you that it also, I mean, the last years there were also some new results, and one of them is, for instance, this one, that if the group is 2 generated and it has the potency class 2, then it has also a positive answer the model isomorphism problem. This is the result of Brosha and Del Rio, which uh, appeared this year. It's a few years old, but it was published this year. And one of the first results, actually, on that problem, after the uh, small groups and the building groups, was given by Passi and Sudarshan Segal in 72. So I first formulate the result like this, and we will later see another formulation. So the model isomorphism problem, I denoted MIP. It has a positive answer for a group G. G is now, of course, always a P group in this setting. It's an importance class at most two, and additionally, we have the condition that the derived subgroup is elementary abelian, and in case of P odd, the exponent of G should also be P, and in case of P equal two, we can also allow exponent four, otherwise we would have abelian groups anyway. So for this class of groups, we have a positive answer. And this result, um, and the techniques used to, or the ideas used to prove it, were influential in the studies later, as I will show you now, and also it influenced what we were still doing this year. And to, to explain it, let me introduce a little bit of notation. So I first need to introduce the so-called uh, dimension subgroups and the so-called augmentation map. Uh, so whenever you have a group ring, 
uh, well, RG, you have typical element, no, looking like that, sum of some coefficients from the ring over the group basis G. And there's a natural map associated to the group ring called the augmentation map, which maps is a suggest sum in a group ring to the sum of the coefficients inside the ring. This is a homomorphism of rings. And the kernel of this homomorphism is called the augmentation ideal, which I denote by I of RG. And uh, the subgroups of G mentioned also this morning by Professor Hales as other so-called M's dimension subgroups, which we can define as being the intersection of the group G with the M's power of the augmentation ideal. Now, okay, the M's power of the augmentation ideal is the element of uh, augmentation zero, but if we add one, so this part here, it might contain some elements from the group. It might also be not contain anything, but it might something contain something, and then you have a subgroup of the group G. And this is called the M's dimension subgroup, if you do it for the M's power of the augmentation ideal. Now, in general, these dimension subgroups will be very complicated if you have any ring and any group, and there were these deep conjectures on which Passy worked in the beginning of his career. But in this particular situation, uh, which we study with the model isomorphism problem, then you find a P group and the field of characteristic P, and then these uh, guys are well behaved. So they are kind of easy to describe. There's a technical a bit of formula, but the important thing is that you can describe them in the terms of the group. You don't need anything from the grouping to describe them. And this were already results from Jennings from 1940, and another description was given by Lazar in 54. And these descriptions is what was used by Passi and Sega to show some results on the group algebras, and actually what has been used since then often to give such results. And what they actually proved in their paper is that certain quotients of these dimensions of group series, they do not depend on the group base you start with. So if you have an isomorphism between Kg and Kh, then certain quotients of the series will be uh, isomorphic for G and H in this situation. And this is, it's a kind of two-step quotient. So if you take any M's dimension subgroup and you take the quotient by the M plus two's dimension subgroup, then this is an invariant, uh, we say, of the group ring. <coughs> and if you uh, put M equal one here, then this is basically this is, and the result I gave you before. And you assume that then if the third dimension subgroup is trivial, you get a positive answer for the isomorphism problem. And what they also proved in this paper, that certain sets um, are also not depending on the group base you start from, and the sets can be built in the following way. So you start with the M's dimension subgroup of G, view it as a, uh, well, as contained in the group ring, the group algebra, and you take the M plus one's power of the augmentation ideal and add this. And then what you get is a set, okay, it's actually an ideal, which was studied before by Zasnaus. And what they showed is that this set will, this ideal will not depend again on the choice of the group base. So for G and H, if H is another basis of KG, another group basis, then the set will be the same, physically the same for H and for G. And in this formulation, uh, Hertwig and Soriano somehow described the strategy, how one could attack uh, the model isomorphism problem from this viewpoint. Uh, because if you, okay, in principle, G is a finite group, K you can take the field of P elements, so you have a finite structure, and you can study it because it's finite, somehow it seems maybe easy, but it's very complicated, no, it's a very big structure, and it's not easy to study, so you want maybe to study something smaller, which still contains all the information you need. And this might view, be viewed the following way, which is more, uh, maybe even a philosophical way to view it, I don't know, Somehow, I mean, this, this things were done before, before Hertha and Soriano described it in this way, but as a way of looking on it, uh, they described it very explicitly. The idea is somewhat the following, that you have an ideal J, say in KG, with the following property, that if you intersect J with these ideals of uh, Passy and Segel I showed you before, so these were the guys from the slide before, when you intersect it, you always land in this right right hand side. No? So you don't intersect actually this dimension subgroup, but you always land in this m plus one's power of the augmentation ideal. So let's say you have an ideal like this. For all m, you have this property. Then, if you have an isomorphism of kg and kh, then you can think that h is contained in kg somewhere as a set, in a group isomorphic to h, let's say h itself. And as this property of j, you will see that when you factor out j, so you consider this uh, ring, which is a quotient of kg by j, and now you look into the unit group of this ring, 
then H will be completely, completely there. So you will not cut off anything from H if you choose your ideal in this way. Now you can hope that in this unit group of the quotient, this is somehow smaller than what you started from, and it might be easier to, to do calculations there. And then you could say, okay, H is somewhere there. So let's look for H. You look for all the possible H's in there, so you look for all the conjugacy classes of groups isomorphic to H in this quotient. And if H is coming from before, it was a group base in KG, no? So it must be mapped into one of these classes. So you could take for each of these conjugacy classes one pre-image in the group in KG, and you can check this pre-image uh, for two properties which you need to have to be, to be coming from this group base. So first of all, it needs still to be isomorphic with H, and it needs to be a basis. It needs to span uh, the space KG. And okay, if you do this, in principle, if you do it for every class, and you obtain for every class a negative answer that none of these classes uh, was either isomorphic to H or it was not spanning KG, one of the two things, then you know that actually what you started from was not correct. So you will not have an isomorphism of KG and KH. Or on the other hand, if you find a pre-image with its properties, well, then you have found a group base isomorphic to H in KG, which means you have a counterexample to the model isomorphism problem. Now, this sounds very nice somehow, but on the other hand, you can ask, well, okay, it's, what is this J you now? How do we start? And okay, of course, you can always take J to be the zero idea, for example, but then you win nothing. <coughs> Sorry. And Hertig and Seriano, they gave somehow an idea how such J can be constructed in general. But even if you carry out this... Sorry? Okay. Um, even if you do what they did, in most situations, uh, you will not be able to, to carry out this program. I mean, you can construct maybe this J, and maybe you were even so lucky to construct this conjugacy classes, but to, for each of the pre-images to decide what it has, there are just too many possibilities. It will often not work, but sometimes it does. And if you view it in this way, then you can say that the following results are somehow uh, were proven by the strategy. So in the situation of Passi and Sega, uh, what they actually showed is that this J could be taken so big that when you cut it off, the unit group of what is left is actually G. So you have nothing left and you cannot look for other group bases because there's only G left and then you're done. And uh, so now that you know the dimension subgroup is, we can say that what they actually proved is that if the third dimension subgroup of G is trivial, then you have a positive answer for the model isomorphism problem. And another kind of ideal was used by uh, Sandling, who found in the situation when the group has class two and the derived subgroup is elementary abelian, that he could construct an ideal uh, that when you cut it off, the unit group of what you get is G times something abelian, which he could uniquely describe uh, coming from G. And then he could also say that, okay, the only possibility to have another group base is again to having this G, because you can use, you can cut off this abelian part. And Hedwig Soriano, well, in the paper where they introduced this as an explicit strategy, they carry this out for specific groups of order 2 to the 6, <coughs> so 6, 64, this is. And uh, if you read the paper, it's kind of technical to do it, and not so easy. So even for these groups, which are not small, not, but not very big either. And the variation of this was also used by Hedwig to show that if you have trivial fourth dimension subgroup, you get a positive answer for the model isomorphism problem. Uh, but under the additional assumption that P is not. And well, together with uh, Angel de Rio and Diego Garcia Lucas from the University of Murcia, uh, we studied two generated groups with cyclic derived subgroup, which is uh, subgroups which have been classified before for this purpose by uh, Garcia de Rio and Brocha. And for some groups where we had, we thought, well, maybe we can use a strategy. And we were able to use it uh, for some two generated two groups uh, successfully to prove the MIP. But more importantly, we could also then use it uh, for other of those groups to find another group base. So to uh, restricting what we need to look for in terms of group bases, we could construct a counterexample. It's a model isomorphism problem. This happened uh, this summer. And I'm just showing you these groups, uh, which have order two to the nine or bigger. Uh, just to show you they're easy to construct and also because there will be several groups constructions coming up in my talk. 
So you just take two integers, n and n bigger than m, both bigger than two, and you construct two groups, which are generated by two elements, a and b, or x and y, respectively. And the third element is just a commutator, which you define like that for purposes of writing it easier. And the first generator in both groups has order 2 to the n. The second generator has order 2 to the n. The commutator has order 4. This is here. And then you still need to define what we still define as the action of the elements on the commutator subgroup. <coughs> so the action of the first generator is always by inversion. And the action of the second generator in one case is trivial. <coughs> and in the other case, it's also by inversion. And you can see that because this guy here is looking out of the box, it must be probably a counter example. Otherwise, why should it? do it and well okay for these two groups you will have isomorphic group algebras over any field of characteristic two so we found a counter example here i should say that still it's very interesting to to look for other counter examples in particular in the odd case and there are many classes which are open so odd groups would be open and also notice that we use here that uh, the derived subgroup as a cyclic of order four and then if it's elementary abelian it's still open and uh, which are class else? Well, metabelian groups are still open, and there are some, well, not metabelian, groups of class two are still open. So there are many interesting questions left. And this is how this article of uh, Passi and Segal from 72, almost over 50 years later, it gave us, influenced our result in this way. And naturally now come to the second type of question I wanted to mention. So how far are units from being trivial? This was one of the three main questions. And I showed you before this uh, result of Higman. Uh, so in the integral case, in the integral cases, it's even easier to say what the trivial unit is because there are not so many units in the base ring. The only units are plus and minus g. So in the integral group ring, the trivial unit is just plus minus g for some element of the group g. So Higman showed that if g is a billion, then the units of finite order in the integral group ring are trivial physically, not only up to something, but really <coughs> really trivial. But already Higman also himself knew that you cannot hope to get a good result as this in the non-abelian case, even in the smallest non-abelian groups, which are denoted by S3, the symmetric group of order six, and you will not have uh, only trivial units. <coughs> there will be units which are not trivial or finite order in the grouping. But other Sassenhaus thought about this in the 70s, and you can ask, well, maybe they're not trivial, but maybe up to conjugation. It will not be true up to conjugation in the integral grouping, in this group. But if you allow conjugation to happen in a bigger structure, in the unit group of the rational group algebra, say, you know, so we place, replace here the integers by the rationals, then this might be true, that any unit of finite order is trivial up to conjugation in this bigger unit group. And this was a conjecture studied also by many mathematicians again. And I give you a few results. So one of the break uh, results was given by L. Weiss. He proved from the important groups. This here is a result by Luther and Passi. Um, so if you have an abelian subgroup, normal subgroup of index two, then you have a positive answer for the conjecture. These are two results of Martin Hertig. Again, so if you have a normal P subgroup with a billion quotient, you will have a positive answer. Or if you have metacyclic groups, you will have a positive answer. Maybe yeah, I should mention that this class of metacyclic groups. So this result covered many, many papers from the 80s and 90s, which studied uh, several subclasses of metacyclic groups under some conditions and so on. So this was kind of maybe even expected to be a class containing maybe a counterexample, but it's actually true. This work of Hertig was generalized by Mauricio Caicedo, Angel Del Rio, and myself to cyclic by reading groups. Or, for instance, uh, for non-solvable groups, one can show, for instance, that it's true for special linear groups of two times two matrices of the field of P elements, work of Mariano Serrano and Angel de Rio. Or using all the knowledge we had at the time, and um, computers, of course, also, we could check it for all groups of order smaller than 144, 144, and so on. And the first contribution by Passi and this question was together with Luther in the late 80s, uh, they showed that the Tassel conjecture holds for the alternating groups of degree 5, for the smallest non-abelian simple group. Okay, now you can look on this result, you can say, well, okay, very nice, uh, it's the smallest non-abelian simple group, you have a positive answer, looks good, but it's still one group. 
it's not so I mean, it's not a huge result for a class or anything but in fact this paper of Luther and Passi had a huge influence by the methods they introduced to study this example on the on the continuation of the story and let me explain you a little bit this method so remember that the augmentation of the grouping element uh, was the sum of all coefficients. And now let's fix some conjugacy class. Let's say have some element X in your group G. And we define then the partial augmentation of an element of a group ring, let's say like this again, at X by not taking the sum of all coefficients, but the part of sum of some coefficients, so partial augmentation. Namely the coefficients corresponding to this uh, fixed conjugacy class which we started from. Is that denoted by epsilon x? And what was observed in the late 80s by Machina, Peter, Zegel, and Weiss is that you can use these guys, these partial augmentations, uh, to reformulate the Sassnaus conjecture. And uh, so the formula this proves the following that if you take an element of a unit of final order and then take a group ring, then it will be trivial up to conjugation in the rational group algebra. So it will satisfy this conjecture of Sassnaus. If and only if all the partial augmentations of U are, are zero, except for one of them. And this is what Luther and Passi used in their proof of the Sassan structure for the alternating group of the D5. And they formulated it differently, but they will put it like this. So let's say you have a unit of finite order in the interval group. If you take a character of the group G, the ordinary character, complex character, then you can it comes from some representation which you can extend to the group ring, and so you can also extend the character. And if you evaluate the character of this unit U, and if you think about it for two minutes, what these partial permutations are, you will see that it is the same as summing over the, cl over the conjugacy classes of G, and then multiplying the partial permutations at this class with the value of the character at an element of this class. Sorry, this G should be an X so type. So you sum over all classes like this. You have an easy formula somehow for this character value. And this character is also coming from a representation of the, of, uh, the group generated by U. No? Because it's coming from a representation of the unit group of the group ring. So if you take another character of the cyclic group generated by U, say Psi, and you look on it, well, it's also a proper character, you have two proper characters. So if you take the scalar product of these characters, you should get non-negative integers, which is a well, general fact from character theory. And this scalar product here can be written out using, again, this kind of formula, and taking Psi to be some specific character. This can be written in a formula, where you can then say, okay, in this formula, we view the partial augmentations as unknowns for which we want to know something. So we want to restrict the possible partial augmentations of the unit we started from, and from these expressions, you have these inequalities, which you can solve. And you will, in any case, if you start from U having some specific order, you will get finitely many solutions. This is also something which was showed a bit later by uh, Luther, Passi, and Hales, I believe, using this kind of method. And if you're lucky enough in your situation, then you will have only, that you will get that all of these partial augmentations would be zero with one exception, and you can apply much in the Zegel and Weiss to know that your unit is conjugate in the rational group of the trivial, trivial unit. Or maybe even more interesting, you get some possibilities, some solutions which are not of this shape, so where there are some values which are not zero, several values. But then what you still know is that if you have a unit with these properties, you have still a lot of knowledge about these units. You get these partial augmentations, and you can think more about what happens to them. Now, in the way um, I wrote it down here, the idea it seems to kind of clear that this is an algorithm, and I believe this was realized by Wolfgang Kimmerle. So let me give some applications of this kind of algorithm which we had in time. So as I said before, Hales, Luther, and Passi wrote a follow-up paper of this, and I believe from that came also the George Baker position, which Hales spoke about in the morning, which will also come again soon. So they use this to bound in the partial mutations, the absolute value of partial mutations. Also a nice result to show also that there are only many, finitely many possibilities for these partial mutations. Then, and in terms of algorithmic way, uh, Roland Wagner uh, applied in a student thesis this thing to certain groups having uh, generic character tables of some values you can plug in. This was in the early 90s. As I have to take again, he extended this 
to Bella characters under some conditions, which I'm not speaking about now. And this method then, after Hedwig did it, it was uh, named by Alexander Konovalov in this way, HELP, where HE stands for, uh, for Hertwig, L stands for Luta, and P stands for uh, Passy. And it was implemented then on computers, it was implemented by several people, and one of these implementations, and which is also a public implementation, uh, was written by Andreas Bechtel and myself as a get package, so that we can apply this method of Luta and Passy, if anybody can apply it without writing its own program. If you want to do it, contact me, and uh, I can explain you how to do it. And then this, we used it to study specific groups, or specific classes of groups, and it played also a role in some results I showed before, for instance, in the cyclic by abelian uh, groups or the metacyclic groups. Some cases where handling uses this method in a generic way. And as I told you before, uh, even if this method is not enough to, to prove the Sassan's conjecture maybe for your group, it is still very nice because you can um, get restrictions on the possible counterexamples and know about. And this was one of the main ingredients and the result I will show later. And the second main ingredient is another idea from the same paper of Machinta Gisdazegui and Weiss, that there are also contributions made by Passi later. And the idea is roughly speaking the following, that if you have a normal subgroup N of G, of say index M, uh, then you have a natural uh, action on the cosets of n by n, and you can view this action uh, by embedding the group ring in the matrix ring over the grouping of n of m times m matrices, m is the index. Now, this you can always do, but if you assume that n is important, then this can actually be made useful in some situations. And what my general theory and Weiss uh, did, they showed that you can reformulate the Sassan's conjecture on a certain class of units, namely on the units which go to the identity modulo, the natural map of N, you can study these units by instead studying conjugacy of matrices in over that N in this bigger matrix ring over the rationals and showing some properties there. And they used this to show certain results and it was later shown by Marciniak and Sega that when M is at most two, this will actually always work for this kind of unit. And the case M equal one is actually just the uh, grouping of an important group. So this was done by Weiss, as I showed you before. And the case M equal two was done by Luther and Passi. And they got from this as a result about a billion by C2, which I saw before. But it was also shown uh, in 99 by Cliff and Weiss that the strategy of looking only on matrices in an abstract way, it cannot work uh, if you start from matrices of size six or bigger. It will not work. And so people didn't use the strategy after that anymore. Uh, but some of Angel del Rio, uh, they realized in Murcia, Angel del Rio maybe realized first, I guess, that maybe this is what given by show, it's a very general theorem about matrices in this matrix ring over that N, but the matrices they use uh, not coming from units, so it's not, you cannot say that this fails a strategy to show the Tassan's conjecture just because some matrices fail this criterion of machine as a grand vice. And so we used these ideas of Cliff and Weiss from their paper to develop uh, some more inequalities, which generalized these inequalities which we got from the method of Luther and Passy, and get more restrictions on possible on the partial limitations of possible counterexamples, which we then finally could use together with Florian Eisler to construct also a counterexample to the Sassnos conjecture. And uh, I will show explicit groups today and all the counterexamples. So in this case, uh, you take P and Q two primes, you take a direct product of two cyclic groups, both of order P and Q, P times Q, sorry. You take a certain divisor D of P minus one and Q minus one, a common divisor, and you can start another group A, A for action, uh, which is a direct product of cyclic groups, one of order P square minus one over D, and one of order Q square minus one. And then you can define a certain action of A on N, such that you get counterexamples with Sassan's conjecture. The smallest values you can take are P equals seven, Q equals 19, and D equals three. And this is not only coincidence for these numbers, but if you take these primes big enough, you can get as many counterexamples as you like, in the sense that for any Number M, you start from, you get M conjugacy classes of counterexamples in the rational group algebra. So there are many counterexamples in here. 
And again, it started with this method of uh, Lutheran Passy, which influenced this Cliff and Weiss method, which influenced us and gave us in the end this result. And also here, also we have a counterexample to the conjecture of Zassenhaus. Uh, if you consider the question, as I did in the beginning, like kind of trivial, and you ask yourself what this kind of might mean, there are still many formulations which are interesting, in particular about the orders <coughs> of torsion units, or also if you allow conjugation not only in the rational group algebra of G, but in the rational group algebra of a bigger group, this would be an open question. <coughs> so there are many things which are still open. And uh, it's still motivating to work on it. So this was the second kind of question I wanted to speak about. And the third kind is uh, about the relation of G as a group and the, unit, the relation of U or G as a, as a group, as a unit group. And this is actually the same as what uh, Professor Hale spoke about this morning, the Jordan decomposition. And uh, I, I will tell you why I started on this, and it's very, very fresh. So in this topic, I'm really not a big expert yet. Maybe I will say something which is not entirely correct. I hope not. Okay, let me give you this definition, which uh, Hales also gave this morning. So we call an element of the rational group algebra nilpotent. Well, if a certain power is zero, and some power of zero. And we call it semi-simple if, as a matrix, somehow it's diagonalizable, or you can say, well, the endomorphism associated to multiplication by this element is diagonalizable over the algebraic closure of your field you're working over, so diagonalizable over the complex numbers. And we call a unit of the rational group algebra unipotent, uh, yes, if uh, after subtracting one, it is an important element. And these facts, which we saw also this morning, <clears throat> about job in composition in, in general algebras actually, but in particular in the rational group algebra, <clears throat> which is the case I'm studying now. So any element in the rational group algebra you can write uniquely as the sum of a semi-simple element and an important element which commute. And this is also true for units if you replace the important thing by unipotent. So you can write any unit uniquely as a product of a semi-simple unit and the unipotent unit which commute. So these are the additive and Jordan, the comp additive Jordan decomposition and multiplicative Jordan decomposition, respectively. And I will say in this talk, it's not very nice maybe to say, but I will just say it. G has AJD if whenever you take an element of the integral group ring and you decompose it additively, both of these parts are in the integral group ring. And when you do the same multiplicatively in the unit group, we say that G has MJD. And it's easy to show that <coughs> this AJD property will apply MJD. It actually came up today in the talk of Hales. And then there were these questions posed by patient Hales. And the first question also by Lutra in this paper. <clears throat> so the questions were somehow, which groups have this AJD property and which groups have this MJD property? And this result of MJD, AJD we saw also this morning, that it is true if and only if, so here we have a really complete classification. It is true if and only if G is abelian or it is uh, the direct part of a quaternion group of order 8 with an elementary building group uh, of two power order. With another abelian group, uh, such as this abelian group has a property that uh, 2, uh, the order of 2 is odd modulo uh, the order of this abelian factor A. And one more class of groups, which are the hydral groups of order 2P for P and E prime. <coughs> so this first question, <coughs> which was asked by Kesuta and Passi, was answered very shortly afterwards by Kesuta and Passi. But the second question on MJD uh, is still open in general. So there is this result, which we also saw this morning. I'm not giving it in complete detail, but it tells you that, okay, if the group is MJD, then either it has also AJD, so it's one of the groups we saw before, or there is a, sh a short list of other possibilities. Uh, now this morning, I don't know, when I prepared this talk, I counted 11, two groups, which might come up. I think in today in the talk there were eight, so maybe, I, well, there are a few small groups, which are two groups of order at most 32. They have all MJD, and the groups of order 27 also have MJD. So this class is completely known. Then there is this class of groups, which are the quaternion group of order 8 times the cyclic group of order P, with the condition that the order of 2 is even, modulo, modulo P. And for this class, uh, there are some results of Kuo and Sun. Uh, some positive results under some conditions on P, and also in the thesis of Sun uh, from Taipei University, 
there are some negative cases where you use computers for small primes to get some negative results. Then there's a class of groups. Uh, so, I mean, there are a lot of names here. No, Aurora, Hell School, Leo, Pesman, Parmeta, Passisun. So, you see, it was a very fruitful uh, field, and most of these people wrote several papers on this topic. So, the third class, you have an action of a cyclic group of two power order on a cyclic group of order P by inversion. And um, if K is one or two, you have a positive answer. If K is at least three, you have a negative answer for P congruent to three modulo four. And I think the rest is open in this class. This is the result of Hales and Passy, basically, and also partly Wilson. I forgot the name Wilson here. And another class for which I believe basically everything is open is the uh, cyclic group of order seven, in which we have an action of a group of C power order. Well, the case K equal one has been solved positive, but I think all the other cases are open. And I'm not working on this uh, decomposition, this multi decomposition, but on something uh, connected to it. And somehow this comes from the tools which were used to, to study this Jordan decomposition and to get these results. So as it was mentioned by Hales this morning, explicitly to study the Jordan decomposition for some group, it will be very painful because you need to study generically all units in the group ring, which except for small cases is impossible. But uh, luckily some uh, these people came up with smart tools to study this decomposition. And uh, let me introduce a few notations for this. So <clears throat> this first one is about matrix components, which was not used so far. So if we have a rational group algebra, it is semi simple and we can decompose it as a direct product of matrix rings over certain division algebras. This is a very advanced theorem. And we call such a factor in this decomposition a matrix component, well, if it consists of matrices. So if this N here is at least two. Yeah, so if not just a division algebra or a field, but really matrices over something. And uh, two more definitions. We say that G is a so-called new probability composition, MD, uh, which was also introduced today by Hales. <clears throat> if you have the following, that for each important element N in the group ring, which you start from in the integral group ring, whenever you multiply the primitive central important coming from the rational group algebra, you still get something from the group ring. So as explained in this morning uh, by Hales, if you project this element n, you view this n as being somehow embedded now in this product, has some coefficients in these matrices, and if you cut off all the matrices and stay only in one component, then you still are in the integral looping. This is somehow the property, which makes it easier to study uh, the MJD. And another thing introduced by Pesman and uh, Liu uh, was the SM property <coughs> of groups. So it's a very group theoretical property. So whenever you have a so GFSN uh, is the following holds that whenever you take a subgroup Y of uh, G and you take some normal subgroup N of G, then either the normal subgroup already lives in Y, or uh, when you multiply the two of them, you get another normal subgroup. So basically, you cannot enlarge subgroups, but by normal subgroup without being normal again, something like that. I don't. I think SN stands maybe for subgroup normal. I'm not sure. <clears throat> and then this property FSN uh, is a subgroup. This first has certainly subgroups. We say that the G has this property at SSN. If for each subgroup of G, you can have you have this property SN. And what was uh, proven by Hales, Pass, and Wilson is that when you have a group of MJD, you will also have a group of ND. And by Leo and Passman, the same for SSN. And these properties are now much nicer to study than the whole unit group. So for ND, for instance, you can construct important elements, which might be easier than units, and also you can construct just one important element with some bad properties to show that MJD does not hold. And the same kind of thing for SSM. Now an observation uh, by Jespers and Sun, at least I learned it from SM, I don't know, maybe people have thought about this before, is the following, that if you have a group of MJD, of which you know it has MJD, in the sense that we have a result for it, and you look on the uh, variable and decomposition, you will have at most one matrix component. <clears throat> so abelian groups come up, okay, and those which have only uh, division algebras in their decomposition. But even if you have matrices, for those groups that we know MJD, we have only one component of matrices. I mean, there are candidates of groups which might have MJD from the slide before, which have more than one component. So it's not a theorem that it's true, but it's an observation which is true for as far as we know. 
And moreover, the connection of this at most one matrix component with the properties we have here, is one more connection is that, uh, well, this is easy to show that if you have at most one matrix component, then this ND property, it easily follows. Because <coughs> if you have the important element, it already lives in this unique matrix component, and then you don't do anything when you multiply your central perimeter by importance, except maybe going to zero. So these kind of observations <coughs> and these properties, uh, they inspire Jesper Sanson to look a bit more into the connection between the properties, how do this group connect, what can we say? And what they did is uh, in a recent paper, uh, yes, 2020, uh, at least the preprint was published, I'm not sure it's published yet. Uh, so they gave a classification for all the SSN groups which have at most one matrix component. So they introduced this other element of matrix component, which might be connected to the uh, origin of the composition, but we're not sure. So they classified as groups, and what they observed is that for many of these groups uh, which they had, um, those which had um, ND, they had actually only one matrix component. <coughs> so they conjectured that maybe it's the same. So if you have one matrix component at most, okay, then you have ND, as we know. And they conjectured that if G has ND, then also the other thing is true, then you will have at most one matrix component. And this question is something we started studying with uh, Geoffrey Janssens recently, a few months ago. And you see again that this question comes from something Passy did uh, now about 30 years ago, with together with Hales, with this Jordan composition. And he believes they started it because of partial augmentations in the first place, but it developed into this very nice topic. And, uh, well, first of all, our goal was, or it still is, uh, we didn't still finish, to look into the classification of Jesper Sanson and to decide the conjectures for all of their groups. And they are basically two big classes, one could say, the important uh, groups in, the, in, this, in this classification, non-important groups. <laughs> and for both of them, there are some, the methods used by Hales, Passy, and Wilson, and also then generalized or improved somehow by Liu, they were based on constructing these important elements, but they were not interested in them by themselves, but only to apply them for MJD. But if you read the proofs, and you're interested in this important decomposition, then you get results out of the proofs for the important decomposition. And what we could prove is that um, if you take an important group from this classification, an important SSN group, and it will have more than one matrix component, then it will have no ND. So this conjecture is true, but well, it would be too good no, to end like this. So this is actually not a theorem, it's not connected to, there is exactly one exception. So I mean, this is an infinite class, for every prime you have many groups there, uh, but there is exactly one exception to this conjecture of Jesper Sanson, which is now the easiest counterexample of this of this talk. It's a synthetic product of a C4 by C8 with the action given by inversion, the only possible non-trivial action. Uh, so this is ongoing work, I don't know what it will lead to. And as you see here, it's clear that there are many interesting questions open. And uh, well, thank you again. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope it was interesting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Leo, for the very interesting talk on unit group with an order in a finite dimensional group algebra is a difficult object to study. And Leo has touched upon the three hot questions, uh, which are close to the heart of group bringers for last half a century. And uh, he has beautifully summed up uh, the entire uh, three questions in a very, very nice way. Thank you, Leo. Well, I could not sum up everything, but I just showed some some some, instant, of, uh, some glimpses of what what is in the uh, related to the work of Professor Passi in the three questions very very beautifully. So it's a deep topic, and I think it's a vast uh, literature available on these three topics, and very close to the heart of group members. So are there questions, please? I have a question. Yes. Uh, probably it's a neat question. It uh, relates to uh, Luther Passi method on uh, Zasanov's conjecture. Yes. So, um, I'm, I've never worked deeply into it, but um, as I understood uh, the method which was developed for A5 alternating group, so that mm -hmm. was later on extended to using uh, bringing broader characters into picture, and then you know the computations <laughs> were used 
into uh, the health uh, package, right? Yes. So yes. I am just curious to know what other groups could be handled uh, using uh, the the strategy. With, with I mean, it was done for a particular case A five there. So uh, did you uh, ever try doing it? Um, you know, solving these equations that you talk about. For yes, of course. Well, groups we did a lot. And, I mean, so. Um, even if it doesn't work, I mean, sometimes it works for the groups, but for instance, this result of order <laughs> groups of nodes of order 144. No? The, I mean, the first step is here, you take any group, you apply this, this algorithm, and then to the partial mutations left, you try to apply some more. But the basic ingredient is always this, which gives you this finitely many possibilities of which you can do more. <laughs> and uh, well, maybe advertise the uh, proceedings of the Bangalore conference. I mean, I spoke about it. This is kind of something I spoke two years ago in, another, in the conference of honor for Professor Passi, who was luckily still there to, to listen. And that from this one, well, this one example of A5, if you do it for A6, you will not solve Sassan's conjecture, but you will have one possibility left, which you need to consider of partial augmentations by units for the six. But also this one thing that was held by Hertwig, again, we developed a method out of this and uh, for when it is based, it is much stronger also. I mean, it is one of the basic methods of my PhD, I would say. I mean, half of my PhD consists of this little passive method. And um, when you study maybe not the strongest versions of the Sassnos conjecture, but some things related to the orders of units of finite order, then you can get strong results for many groups. And in particular, well, ah, okay, this result is completely uh, help, for example. This SL2P result here. Uh, and actually, you can replace p by p square also. It will still work. I just didn't do it for not putting too much on the slides. Uh, this is completely uh, look up or help, help look up And in this, these two classes here, uh, half the paper is this method, and the other half is other methods. So basically, it's giving uh, strong uh, conditions, strong constraints to rule out various possibilities, and then whatever is left, we uh, look forward to. Um, yes, whatever is left, you try, you try more and try to develop more things. And, I mean, okay, for example, for A seven, it's still open. That's not nice conjecture, so I don't know. You can still try to do it. Thank you. Are there more questions? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again for a very, very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. So now we are heading towards uh, the going back to the memory lane. And uh, we have some friends of Professor Pasi, collaborators of Professor Pasi, who would like to share their memories. So may I request Professor Parimala to share Mm, there she is. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good evening, Professor Bamba. And, uh, thank you, Gurmit, for uh, thinking of me to say a few words on this occasion. Well, we have you have been hearing so much about Pasi's mathematics. Let me just say, I have known the Pasi since my uh, student days. At the, at the Tata Institute through Professor Sridharan. And uh, I and Raman came to know Professor Pasi and, and his family more closely during their visit. They are the foundation. Find your best. Is it, uh, is it okay, or there is some? Maybe organizers can mute people. Yeah. The host can mute. Yeah, yeah. who is the host? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Shall I go forward? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Um. Uh, so I came to know Pasi uh, more closely when he was on a sabbatical visit to the Tata Institute. And he stayed there for a while. And uh, since then, my association with him continued through uh, several visits to Chandigarh, by the way, a department which I came to know very well, and, uh, and a place with such a great tradition for mathematical research. 
I was. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was a wrong, wrong click. So oh. sorry. I'm sorry. It's a. It's a. I don't know. It's. It's, it's a. She can unmute herself. It's okay. Nothing. Okay. Can you? Can you unmute? Can you? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I'm muted now. Okay. Yeah. So I visited Chandigarh for on several occasions. Uh, uh, some of them as thesis examiner for some of his students, possibly good mate, probably for your thesis. I, I, I don't remember where. Okay, and then um, I came to know very closely several colleagues in the depart you know, uh, Department of Mathematics at Chandigarh. And so, besides his um, great contributions to mathematics, uh, uh, of course, uh, you must have also heard his uh, contributions to institution building uh, when he was associated with um, HRI and uh, also with ISA Mohali later on. And, um, and I just want to mention, besides his um, excellent contributions to mathematics, what I admired most in him was his gentleness and humility. I mean, this was something which I adored. So, yeah, so the last, my last interaction with him was when, when he asked me to give a talk at the INSA symposium related to mathematics and society. In fact, he was very proud that he was instrumental and to, in getting this symposium through in which mathematics was part of a societal uh, theme. And uh, so he asked me whether I could say, uh, I could just say a few words on the topic of women in mathematics in India. So that was, the, that was my last interaction. Of course, needless, needless to say, I'll miss a true friend and a fine colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Parimala, for your kind words. Yeah, so we all miss him very, very badly. So uh, we have uh, Professor Parsi's daughter, Erika Sethi, from USA. Uh, may I request Erika to say a few words? Thank you, uh, Gurmeet. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Erika. I'm a younger daughter of Dr. Indabir Singh Parsi. Uh, on behalf of my family, I would like to express my gratitude for all your kind words and gestures. We are honored by the respect and love that you have showered on my father and our family. All of you were very dear to my father, and the friendship and collaboration that he shared with you were his prized possessions. I often refer to my sister and myself as merely his biological children, and some of you mainly as his math daughters, sons, brothers, and sisters. You were his extended family who shared his passion for mathematical research and teaching. Although I personally did not share this passion for mathematics and pursued a career in healthcare, I learned the most important lessons of life from watching him. Every step of my life has been influenced by following his example. I had the privilege of growing up in a household with unmatched harmony with an environment that was beyond usual social norms, where we never heard about typical roles of daughters, where daughters could fly far to achieve their dreams. Even when it was somewhat uncommon to send your daughters halfway across the world for their education at your personal expense, he sent me to graduate school in Canada so I could do just that. Even though we shared different academic interests, he would often tell me how proud he was of my achievements. Whenever something good happened in my life, he was always the first person to whom I would want to tell because he was always so genuinely happy for me and his words of encouragement meant the world to me. He led by example, instilling the value of hard work and honesty in all of us. His favorite words, victory with determination, and no matter what, always speak the truth, will resonate with me for all times to come. 
The respect that he got from everyone around him was self-evident from their behavior and cannot be exactly expressed in words. It was impressive to see that people at all levels could always discuss their problems and ideas so comfortably with him. This was because he would always make a conscientious effort to make them comfortable with his kind gestures, modest demeanor, and down-to-earth etiquette. His words were chosen carefully to give them the best advice, yet always making sure those would never offend anyone. Benefit of the person in front of him was first and foremost in his mind, always. His heart was full of love for his family. My parents had a blessed marriage for 58 years. They were best friends, soulmates, who lived in tremendous harmony, complementing each other's strengths. He had my mother's unwavering support in his education, career, and health until his last breath. He loved his daughters dearly and made sure to express it time and time again. Besides his contributions to his field in mathematics, modesty, honesty, and kindness towards everyone are part of my father's legacy that will live in our hearts forever. In his honor, I would like to encourage all of us to aspire to be like him. Thank you again to the presenters, uh, Dr. Hales, Dr. Prasad, Dr. Margolis, everyone who shared their kind words and memories with my father, all the attendees for their generous time, uh, sponsor Dr. Kurana, and last but not least, uh, my father's math daughter, Dr. Gurmeet Bakshi. My father could not have been more proud of all of you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erika, for your kind words and for joining us today. I know you, this, despite the time difference, you were there in the morning. You're there at this time also. I know it's going to be your office time soon. So thank you so much. Thank you. Coming. Thank you for including us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. So I now invite uh, Professor Ghorpade to share a few memories, please. Sir Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gurmeet. And uh, thank you for asking me to say a few words. It's my pleasure and honor to say something about Professor Pasi. Uh, I think uh, I probably met him first in 1994, if I'm not mistaken, when there was a instructional school on algebraic geometry in Chandigarh that uh, Srinivas and some other people uh, organized. And I was sort of one of the participants there and had a opportunity to spend about a month in Chandigarh. And of course, then you would run into Professor Pasi and have many discussions. Uh, also, I remember talking to Professor Sarkaria uh, and <clears throat> other senior yeah. colleagues like uh, Linda and so on at that time. But, uh, and then of course, uh, uh, we had uh, on several occasions, uh, had an opportunity to meet and talk with Professor Pasi. And, one thing that uh, always impressed you, I think many people have said this, that he was a, as not only a, a wonderful mathematician, but a thorough gentleman. And it, it always left a positive feeling, a very, uh, you know, warm, cordial uh, feeling when you when you met him, when you discussed things with him. Uh, we met not only in Chandigarh, but also in IIT Bombay or other places uh, during conferences. And, uh, you know, it, 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 as I said, it was, it was a pleasure. Uh, as we have heard since this morning, Professor Pasi has, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, left a mark on our subject by his uh, various contributions. Uh, and, you know, that's something that uh, 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 mathematicians, at least those at the stature of uh, Professor Pasi and so on, can be proud of because, uh, uh, you know, uh, all of us, uh, you know, have to pass someday and but the mathematical ideas uh, live forever. I think uh, it was Hardy who said in his uh, apologies that uh, immortality may be a silly word, but uh, mathematicians perhaps have the best chance of uh, uh, achieving it. I mean, he sort of uh, gave example that uh, Archimedes uh, will be remembered while Achilles is forgotten and so on and so forth. So, um, so we will, 
the world will continue to remember Professor Pasi, I'm sure, to his mathematics. But as I can see, uh, since this morning, all the sentiments expressed by friends and students and students, students, uh, Gurmeet, uh, whom I have known uh, for many years, uh, I think since she was a student, uh, and then uh, today I think uh, her students, even that she spoke uh, so emotionally with, uh, you know, uh, in a beautiful poetic manner about uh, her uh, mathematical grandfather, and probably this tradition lives on. So Professor Pasi will, I think, continue to live in our memories, uh, not only through his works, but also through the impact that he has uh, left uh, not only on his students and collaborators, but the subsequent uh, uh, generations. And uh, it was a it was a shock to me when Gurmit uh, sent me a message that he is no more. In some ways, I you know, I unfortunately I never had an opportunity to be taught by him or to have a, any chance of collaborating with him. But he was he was not too much uh, um, younger than my own teacher, and in some ways it's kind of ironic. My 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 teacher professor. He, he passed away at the age of 82, just like uh, Professor Pasi. In fact, he passed away on 2nd November, and I, Professor Pasi passed away on 2nd October, uh, more or less at the same age. And you know, uh, and both were active almost till the very end. So uh, maybe in, in another life, I will have an opportunity to be taught by him. Uh, Anyway, I, I want to uh, just end by thanking Gurmeet once again for giving me an opportunity to say a few words and uh, for putting this function together. It has given us a great idea of many facets of his life. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, again, my, my respects to the memory of Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gopani, for sharing your nice words, memories. Uh, May I request uh, Professor Pasman is here. So may I request Professor Pasman to say a few words? Is he here? Yeah. You can request. It's not clear uh, what I'm going to say. I just I just on going down the memory line. This is the first paper I read was the Pasi Pasman inequality on bound on partial augmentations. That was the first paper I read as a research student with Professor Pasi. Uh, I, I met Inde Beer a long, long time ago uh, when I first joined the group ring community. He was working at that time with Sudarshan and Segal. And uh, I think they invited me to uh, Ohio State at that point, I think, and maybe maybe uh, Inde Beer was visiting him. I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, then Sudarshan moved to Edmonton. I, I saw him at least once there. He also came to uh, visit me in Madison. And uh, I know I told this joke to uh, uh, his his uh, family, but uh, if you'll excuse me, I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, Posse and Passman are next to each other alphabetically. He always came right in front of me, but, um, but uh, I had a car, an automobile, and the license plate I had was PASS, followed by the number one. And I was careful to pick him up at the airport with this car, and he thought it was named for him. So um, in any case, uh, that's all I can say. I remember he, uh, he visited my children were in college then. And uh, children sometimes like to share their concerns with you, as I would say. Namely, they would call up on the weekend, and uh, my wife and I would argue as to which of us would answer the phone. And uh, I remember I, I asked Indabir if he wanted to call home, and he said, well, at this point, we don't have a phone at home, um, and uh, 
there's a, a phone down the block, but not one at home. And I said, no phone. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, you know, what a, what a great thing to have. I wish I didn't have a phone. So uh, in, in any case, uh, he understood the joke in any case. And he w I found him always to be just a, a wonderful gentleman, a, a very, very kind and nice person. I'm happy to be here at his meeting, the meeting in his honor. Uh, it's a well-deserved honor for the a gentleman. Uh, thank you for asking me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Passman, for your kind words. And uh, in Leo's talk, uh, you heard of uh, Segal Passi work. And I had an email from Professor Segal uh, that due to some medical reasons, he is not able to join. And he has sent me a message, and which I will read on his behalf. Uh, Professor Segal uh, writes, Inderbir and I have been in touch quite often regarding mathematical matters and also personal matters. The last email of 27th August said in part, Dear Sudarshan, it's so nice to hear from you. I'm currently under treatment from Fortis Hospital, Mohali. After a series of tests, they have identified the problem that is affecting the bones and have started to address the same. It's going to be a prolonged affair. Hope, let's hope that it finally works out. It was quite optimistic. Then came this bombshell. It was a passy no more. And I couldn't help crying. We met in early 1970s when he spent some time at the University of Alberta. We collaborated on several articles. He introduced me to dimension subgroups. My supervisor, Professor Zizanoz, never mentioned the dimension subgroup problem, even though he sold, solved the modular case. Brower, Jennings, Zizanoz series, perhaps. He wanted to save me from the pitfalls as many famous mathematicians had given false proofs of the integral case. Inderbir was generous with his ideas. He has written a large number of interesting articles, collaborated with many international colleagues and trained many top-notch students. He wrote several books, including one with I.S. Luther and one with Roman Thailov. His research books are still relevant. Inderbir has received the highest Indian awards and honors, well deserved. Makes us all proud, he stood as tall in the world of mathematics as he did physically. He was gentle, polite, and helpful to all. My brother Surinder Segal, who is ill, has asked me to convey that Inderbir made his stay in Chandigarh very pleasant and they had some inspiring discussions. It's a big loss to the family. Surinder, Monica, Erika, may God give them strength to bear this loss. May God give peace to the departed soul. Mathematical community mourns his loss, but is proud of his achievements and friendship. We send loves and hugs to Pasi family and to all of you, Erika and Sudarshan. So this is the message I got from Mrs. Segal. Yeah, so... Uh, I, uh, I cannot see in the audience uh, Sujata Ramdaroy and uh, Professor Dani were to join, but due to some reasons, they are not able to. Uh, I don't think that they, they are there. Sujata is not entered. I think. Yeah. So is there anybody who would like to share? Bamba, sir, if you feel comfortable, we'll feel nice if you can say a few words. Yeah, Bamba, sir, is not able to unmute himself. He's trying. Uh, He's okay. not able to do that. Can I do that? No, yeah, you please. Yes, you try to do that. Can you do it? You are a co uh, let, let me try. Let me try. Let me try. Let me 
to. Unmuting has to be done at his end. Yes, yes. Yeah. Unmuting has to be done at his end. Yeah. We can mute, but not unmute. Yes, yes, that's correct. He needs. Uh, he can listen to us, but no, he's trying to get uh, some. He's help. trying to get some help. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 I must say that. What you have done today is the right way of giving tribute to the memory of a great friend, a great teacher, and a great mathematician. Unfortunately, I did not have much mathematical interaction with him, but one was clear that he belongs to the class of very talented people whom we had in our department. He was among the best. I had some interaction with him in administration and there I found him very wise and very efficient. His great quality was that he never lost his temper. In a meeting, when things sometimes did not work well, or with students when there are problems, one could depend on him to not lose his uh, temper and give the right advice and also take care of the interests of all people concerned. He was related to me. Uh, my nephew is married to Pasi's elder daughter. And one could always feel that here was a person who had made such important contribution to mathematics and had a high standing in the field of science, but never threw it around. I must thank Gurmeet and Dinesh for giving him the right tribute in the right way. And also all the people who have participated, given talks, talked about him. It is very satisfying to see how much impact here his work has made in the field of group rings. Sudarshan was also our, one of the first students and I also knew that Sudarshan and Pasi had been collaborating over some time but unfortunately I did not have enough background to understand their work. We all miss him, we'll miss his presence and I hope that Surinder, Monica, and Erica will be able to live with this loss, which will be, which will be impossible to fill. Thank you very much for organizing this meeting. And in the right note for a great man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your kind words and your presence is means a lot to us. You are a pillar of our department. You built this department from the scratch, and your presence is, is a motivation for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, anybody uh, who would like to say anything, it's open. So, okay. okay, so it's time to thank all of you. For me, Professor Pasi was like a father figure who has groomed me from a very young age in all academic and personal affairs. And I owe much of my achievements to him. And I'll miss him. 
thing. I thank you all for sparing so much of your valuable time since morning. We are together listening to the nice words and works of Professor Pasi and recalling some nice moments, nice works. And that makes us pride. Proud. Thank you all. Thank you. And thanks, Gurmeet Ji, to you also you. for all your efforts to for this making this wonderful event a success. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And thanks to all participants, uh, particularly participants from overseas. Professor Passman was there with us in the morning. Yes. He's here with us right now also. Professor Bamba also was with us all through the day. So thanks a lot for it. Thanks a lot to everyone. To everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for such a wonderful session <laughs> and in the evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.